I'm usually good at these cold openings. I think I've done several hundred of them, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> yeah. but I feel like this one needs, uh, I don't know. I feel well, more. This is, di- a, this is a whole new you. This is like <laughs> the, li- quite literally this is the first time this version of you has ever been captured before. So, <laughs> <laughs> so laying the stage, this is me and my good friend, Adam, we are FaceTiming each other, both with Vision Pro on, and I'm looking at his persona. He's looking at my persona. We're also recording our audio separately for the audio version of the podcast. Uh, and we are here <laughs> while using Vision Pro to talk about Vision Pro. That's right. It's a it's a mind bender of like of the, like of a type that I've never ever experienced before. Um, we're capturing ourselves in like eight different ways and also simultaneously viewing ourselves and listening to ourselves in eight different ways. And we've had to figure out how they all connect to each other and what it's all going to turn into for the, for the, for the listener. And that is, it's like, it's, it's, it's the most mind bending exercise in, in cognition that I feel I worry that I'm not able to compute. I'm simply not able to wrap my head around this. <laughs> Let me also, I guess this is an important thing to put up front too, is assuming everything goes well, <laughs> let's just knock on wood about that. We're going to have a YouTube version of this, which is our personas looking at each other talking. And so you might want to, if you're in your podcast player, just listening to the audio, if you're thinking, huh, maybe I'd rather do the YouTube version. Maybe you want to switch over now and see if you like it. Yeah. All right. Uh, what was your buying experience like? I simply ordered it because I know enough now that I don't have to wait in line for the thing. I don't have to be there for the retail experience for the thing to exact. You know, that was the first few years of iPhone. Definitely spent the night in, you know, in front of the Apple store when iPhone one came out. But I, I really just enjoy the convenience of it being shipped. Now it was getting later in the afternoon on ship day and uh, my my few friends who had ordered it, theirs had arrived already and I was getting impatient. So I got in the car and I ran to, the, you know, I drove to the where the UPS truck was in my neighborhood. And I just, you know, I, I've learned the, the, the trick with UPS drivers is, hey, can I save you a trip? That's what you always say, which is a very my dad thing to say. <laughs> can I save you a trip? And then you're on their side, right? They're, uh, you know, you're not trying to be greedy. <laughs> have the thing before it's ready. I can't remember the details of it. I do remember there was one time in the early years, I don't know if it was an iPhone or what, where I chased the FedEx guy down the street somehow, <laughs> you know, and he knew me, you know, and when you, you know, when they, when they know you, they'll, they'll just hand it over. Sure. Um, all right. My buying experience is obviously always different than everybody's because I don't necessarily need to buy it because I've had the review unit since beforehand, but I did buy one. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, since I'll already have one, you know, when I placed the order, um, I knew I was going to, I didn't have the review u- unit yet, but I knew I would. I thought, well, maybe I'll do in-store pickup to see what that's like, you know, because I feel like with this product, it's different. And I don't need to do that with an iPhone or certainly not a Mac, but I thought with this, maybe I will. And I got a Saturday evening uh, pickup. So the second day. Um, And the weirdest part about it was that I got a different light seal size in person at the store Hmm. than I did when I measured myself. And when, when I was out in Cupertino before getting my review unit with Apple, you know, we did the face measuring thing. And for privacy sake there, you know, I've done this, I've had like five demos of this thing since June and every single time I would do the face scan over a, because I guess the software was evolving and they wanted me to use the latest version of the, you know, measure your head with the phone thing. Uh, and then B for privacy reasons, they wouldn't, even if I'd said, just go ahead and keep my eyesight prescription and keep my face size, they, they wouldn't keep it, you know, for privacy. Um, but like two weeks ago, before I got the review unit, I was out in Cupertino for the final briefings before this thing came out and did the face scan again. And then a couple days later did the face scan at home when I did my own pre-order. And so both in Cupertino 
for my review unit and at home when I scanned it myself for the one I bought, both times it came up as a 25W. You know how these things, there's like, I think they go from like 18 to 33 for sizes Mm -hmm. and they're all either N or W and N either stands for normal or narrow. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't really make a difference. And W is wide. Mm -hmm. Um, But then when I went, so they, it was an exact match. It wasn't like, Oh, in Cupertino, I got a 24 and then at home I got a 25 or something like that. They were both 25 W's. But then on Saturday night, when I went to pick up the one I ordered at the Apple store, they said, do you, you know, and, and, you know, they were very nice. The store wasn't crowded, but it, you know, it was six 30 on a Saturday. Um, they cut, kind of, they did kind of know who I was, you know, a couple sure. or, or one of the, you know, one, the guy who kind of gave me the guided tour had no idea, which is kind of the way I wanted it. Mm-hmm. But there were people there who, who knew exactly who I was. Um, but I said, ah, oh, sure. I'll take the guided tour. Let me, I want to see, you know, what, what, regular customers get. And I'm gl- really glad I did. Hmm. But that started with me doing the light seal face scan again. And mm. this time it came up with a 33W, which doesn't sound close to 25 at all. Sounds right. quite different. It seemed like a real dilemma and it seemed like it was un- an unusual situation. It seemed like most customers who had pre-ordered, if they got size 25W, then in the store, they got it again just like I did in Cupertino and at home. And they said, well, let's do it again. Maybe that 33 was weird. So we did it again. 33W. Did it again with a different phone that the Apple store had. 33W. So three times in a row on Saturday night, I measured as a 33W. But two weeks earlier at home and in Cupertino, I got a 25W. And this, it totally triggers my sort of OCD that I have the exact right size. Yeah. (laughs) And if it was, if it had been coming up 25 and 26 or 25 and 27, I would think, ah, who cares? You know, maybe my face gets puffier at the end of the day. I don't know. (laughs) You're retaining water weight. Right. But this, this really, and they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, I guess, you know, uh, and again, it was helpful that, you know, it was all out in the open who I was and what I do. I said, well, you know, because I have the 25W from the review unit at home, why don't I, I'll just swap it out, you know, do the swap out here and I'll take the 33 that I'm measuring with here. And so now I, I, I have two vision pros, my review unit and my, the one I own, and I have two different size light shields, 25W and 33W. And which one feels better? <sighs> This is the worst part, Adam. I don't know, <laughs> but they but they definitely feel different. Do they feel different? How do yeah. they feel different? They're they're not like different shoes. It's not like one fits and one is low, over large. It's it's nope. it's just they they're different. Nope. And there's no practical. Neither one of them has any more light leak than the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, where where it feels most different is the one. That's a 33. And again, I, if I look at them side by side as closely as I can, just take both of them off and just look at the light seals on their own. Uh, and they're, you know, if, for those of you who don't have one yet, they're super easy to attach and detach. They, it, in fact, they're so easy to attach and detach that it's like the number one thing you have to learn is not to pick up the whole device by the light seal because it just right. magnetically pops right off. If I look at the two light seals on their own side by side, I, with my eyes, I can't see what the difference is. They don't, it doesn't look like one. If I stack them on a table, it's like, oh, this one's a half a centimeter taller or something like that. No, I don't even see it. Mm-hmm. But when I put it on, on it feels ever so slightly wider at the sides of my eyes so in other words exactly at the spot on my face where now that i'm getting older i'm developing crow's feet right that that sort of outer edge of the oval of your eyes the 33 feels like it's it just feels like a wider set of goggles, even though when I look at them side by side, I can't see that it's hmm. wider and it just feels a little wider and it, I'm not used to it because I spent so much time during my review process with that 25. Mm-hmm. This feels a little weird to me because I kind of got used to the other one. Mm. Well, wider but, seems like what you would want because, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's a little bit it's give it's giving you a wider berth, you know, and you don't you don't want it to 
the one thing I know from early use is you don't want to scrunch your face because that right. actually has an impact on your facial expression in your in your digital persona. The first time I put mine on and got on a face call, I realized that it was like sitting weird against my forehead and I looked angry. I looked at ang- huh. angry at, at the people I was talking to. Um, so I don't know. I just think you want more comfortable comfort in that in in that realm like a little bit of a looser fit you know a dad a dad gene of uh yeah of i think seal. so so yeah. i that's and so if you told me right now you have to pack up your vision pro and leave your house for a month and you can't go you can only take one of them with you i think i would take the 33 the bigger right. one I, which I think is bigger. I don't even know. I, I just assume a bigger number is bigger. Maybe. It, maybe it's European sizing and smaller yeah. is bigger. Uh, and, and, and I've seen some people speculate that these sizes aren't really, a, that the N and W are more size, yeah. you know, narrow or wide, and that the, the numbers relate more to curvature types, you know, mm. and that some are for flatter faces and some are for rounder faces. And yeah. it's not necessarily a size per se, but this maybe feels, it's just a, yeah, maybe it's just a vibe. Maybe yeah. it's not physically related <laughs> at all. You're just getting an apple sort of an, an assessment of the vibe. And I'm very trusting when it comes to that stuff. I, it's I kind of like the Sphinx knows all, you know, like yeah. Apple, Tim knows, you know, what my sizing needs are. So I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> And I know that my experience might be like two degrees different with the light seal that Tim chose for me, but I'm okay with that. I want that. I want my experience to be defined by that, that instinct of my vibe. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, I would, I would feel so much less, like I said, uh, triggered if it was debating between 25 and 27 instead of 25 and 33, but I think I'm just going to go with the 33 and it just, and it, 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 it's like, I, uh, it it feels like it disappears on my face more than the other one, which I think can only be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's because this is at the end of the day, this is hardware that you don't want to feel. You don't even want to know that it's on your face. And I, 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 you know, we, that's part of this conversation is we have to sort of like define what this thing is and what it isn't. Um, especially like sort of in context of all of the other stuff that Apple makes. I think that's a really important conversation, part of the conversation. But I mean, you know, like the, having used it for a week now, that's my single greatest takeaway is that when you've been using it all day or for hours or whatever it is, you are supposed to, it's supposed to disappear. You're not supposed to think about the fact that you even have this thing on and it should be so stark that when you get up to pee and you go and pass by yourself in the mirror, you're like, oh, oh, that's right. I have a, th- I have a computer strapped to my face and I had almost entirely forgotten about it. And, and you're supposed to forget about it in the way that you are never going to forget that you're using a laptop or an iPhone, right? Yeah, and it's so hard to explain that because uh, it's, it's both simultaneously true for me and on the other hand totally not true that I never yeah. quite forget that I've got a very face heavy thing on my head. <laughs> yeah. You know, it does. Make I know exactly your, what I know exactly what you mean when it's doing the job of immersing you in, in the digital experience in front of you, then you've kind of like, you've kind of forgotten about it, but that's kind of a rare thing to happen because for the most part you are being reminded of the physicality of the thing, whether it's tethered to your pocket or whether you know, you're somebody walks into the room and they're they're like, ha ha, idiot. And you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Every time Amy comes in, she'll she'll say something like that. Right. But I do. I forget <laughs> that I'm there. So I, I don't know if I should have saved this for the end or just get it out of the way at the beginning. But I sure. feel like I want to get it out of the way while it's in my mind because Dude. I feel and I feel like it's 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 a good. It's what we're talking about. And. Mm-hmm. It, I find myself losing time in this device in a yeah. way that I haven't lost time with a device in decades. I mean, I guess I think I think I had the same sort of experience with the iPhone in 2007 when it was brand new. But because that device was so small, it didn't quite feel like I just lost track of time. Like I kind of, it, 
it never felt the iPhone never has felt fully immersive like this. What to me it goes back to is when I first got my first Mac in college in 1991 as a freshman. And it, I was in college for such an interesting period of years because in 1991 the dorms at Drexel didn't even have Ethernet, let alone Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi hadn't, you know, was years away from being invented. So there was no network in the dorms. And by the time I graduated in 1996, everybody had email. Internet was everywhere. It was would have been ridiculous to, th- you know, just in the period from my freshman to senior year of college, it went from nobody has internet and almost nobody has email to everybody's on the internet all the time. Totally. Yeah. I started college in 96. So I was freshman class. We got ethernet in the dorm room. It was, it was life changing. But I, but in my freshman year in particular, like I just spent all of my free time on my computer in my dorm room, even though we didn't have the internet. Hmm. And I wasn't a partier, you know, hardly ever went to like fraternity parties or whatever else freshmen would do. And I, I didn't get involved in the student newspaper at Drexel till my sophomore year. So I didn't really do that. I, I played rec league basketball. It wasn't like I was a total shut in, you know, and I had a bunch of friends who I kept for the rest of college. So it wasn't all day, every night on my computer. But for the most part, what I, how I remember my entire freshman year of college was just spending lots and lots of time on my Mac in my dorm room, not even networked. And then by the end of the year, I've told this story on the podcast before we set up the, what was it called? Uh, the Apple talk network. It wasn't Mm -hmm. the internet. It was just like, like uh, stereo cable, like just copper wire that we hung through the drop ceiling through the floor (laughs) and then dropped into everybody's room. So we could play the game specter together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the sort of battle zone. Yeah, I totally remember 3D that game. game. Yeah. But I, I, if you ask me, well, what did you do when you were just by yourself? Like, and my roommate, my freshman year, did pledge a fraternity, and he would, you know, Friday and Saturday nights was off and out. And we, we, he was a great roommate. He was a friend from high school, and we got along great. But I remember it was sort of like, hey, that's great that he's getting out of here. You know, like I just not, you know, it wasn't like I was, there was no internet. So it wasn't like I was like looking at porn or anything like that. It wasn't that I wanted to be alone for privacy sake. I just wanted to be left alone to use my computer. Well, I know exactly. I know the exact answer to this question. Like, what were you doing? And it's the same answer as what we're doing right now and why we want to spend time in it. It's because you want to be immersed in that world because you've never been there before and it's super exciting and it's almost euphoric because you're yeah. doing stuff that you've never felt before. And it's exactly the same for the first Mac experience or whatever it was that transformed you into a person that wanted to live and work in technology for the rest of your life. Yeah. I, I, again, I did have some games that, you know, there were some weekends where maybe I was playing Leisure Suit Larry or whatever the hot games were of 1991 <laughs> yeah. for the Mac. Sim City Shuffle was Puck big. Cafe. Sim City was a big one in 1991. Karatika. Oh, and the, there was a PGA Tour golf uh, that I really liked. Uh, but a lot of times I was just like in res edit, just taking apart like an application and remaking the icons, you know, in the icon editor inside res edit. Yeah. And, you know, it, it could be like, I don't know, eight, nine o'clock on a Saturday night. My roommate would leave, say he's going to a party. And next thing I know, it's 2.30 in the morning and he's coming back in the room and I'm still sitting there. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, I thought he just left. And then I look up in the corner of my Mac and see that, you know, five hours have gone by and Mm. I'm finding myself having that sort of, I can't believe this, you know, and, and, and the way it manifests itself with this device in particular is I, I know it's fully charged. I've left it fully charged overnight and I think I'll start using it. I think, ah, I'll just watch a couple videos. I've been saving up a couple of these YouTube videos that mm-hmm. I wanted to watch on the device about the device. And uh, next thing I know, I hear this very sad bloop, bloop, bloop. 
<laughs> which is like the, you know, it, it, what, there's an, I think the AirPods make the same sound when yeah, they get yeah, to like yeah. 20% battery life. And then I think to myself, I think I had this experience while trying to review it. I think, ooh, I should quick write this down. The battery life stinks. I, I, and then I check the time and I'm like, oh no, that's been three hours. This is actually much better than the promised battery life. How have I been in here three hours? Yeah. Also, you should just jack into your power when you're not moving around, up walking around. It's just kind of good. It's good hygiene, good practice to just like connect it to power because it is going to run out. We don't need that experience. And it's only in transitory moments that this is a mobile device. Otherwise, it's a computer and you sit down and you use the computer. Um, And I've gone for long periods of time as well, just losing myself. And I feel that the most joy I'm getting out of it in those times of losing myself is just figuring out how the damn machine works, how, how all the software works and really training myself to use it. Because I think that one thing that is, is less often talked about among early vision pro users is that there is a learning curve to this thing. And I remember when my family got our first Mac, it was a Mac classic and it was set up on the dining table so the family could all enjoy this new computer. And you start it up, and there's this like onboarding program, like a game, like an applic- you know, an application that would teach you how to move. Like if you move the mouse around, then the arrow on the screen moves, and you can go up. You like move your hand forward, it goes up, and you select a word, and then it drops down a list of words. And this was like not, we didn't know this stuff already. There, you had to learn it. And I think that that's actually where we kind of are with the Vision Pro is we're still learning what all these conventions are. And of course, we're like way smarter about this stuff now. Um, the learning is going to come quicker, but there is still learning to do. And so I think those early reactions is like, ah, this doesn't work good. This is all, but you know, this is broken stuff. Well, how about you? maybe you haven't learned it yet? Like maybe you're going to get better at this. Even something like typing with the virtual keyboard, you're going to get better. You're going to get learning. You're going to get better at learning the the eye targets. You know, I heard Marco on ATP saying that he discovered that he would look at a thing and before his fingers had tapped it, he was already looking away because he's looking at the next thing, right? You have to, you have to compensate for that. And that's not something you like in, you know, consciously learn. You just, you have to intuitively learn that stuff and develop the muscle memory for it. And I love that we're in that, this phase right now. It's so cool. Uh, And in the same way that like my, and my, that Mac LC had a 12 inch display on a cramped dorm desk. And it's like, well, how can you get fully immersed in a 12 inch display on a, a, by today's standards, incredibly slow computer that had no connection to the outside world other than what you brought in on a floppy disk, but it did. Right. And so in a sense, I, I would fully immerse myself and just be lost for five, six hours back then, just learning and dicking around with the Macintosh. Yeah. So and much the so same that way- families would have an entire room dedicated to that <laughs> machine. Yeah. You know, you go into the computer room if you need right. to immerse yourself. It, it, everybody sort of learned that, I think, when they brought computers in their house, where yeah. it's like, it, or at least if somebody was enthusiastic about it, it's like you kind of need to make ro- a special room for it. You don't want yeah. it in a room where you're people are doing other things. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. But, it, and it's, it, it's in some ways it's, like inside out with this device where Mm. physically there's these reminders that you're wearing a thing on your head that weighs you down. And there's a strap on the back of your head you need to put in right or, or adjust on the back of your head. Right. But on the other hand, what you see really does you, you said it very well earlier in the show. It's like you, you just sort of you do for, sort of forget that you're looking through cameras showing you stuff that's projected onto screens in front of your eyes, and you do pass in front of a mirror, and you're like, "Oh crap, I forgot, uh, I forgot I was wearing it," even though I didn't really forget I was wearing it. Like yeah. there's like a part of your brain that forgets you're wearing it, and another part that can't possibly forget you're wearing it. But and, it yeah. kind of cleaves your brain in two. And the physical, the physicality of the device will only continue to minimize get, you know diminished more and more diminished and like it reminds me of when the iphone 4 came out you got to sit down with steve jobs and i i remember you telling me the story you used it for the first time and you said it look i can't see pixels it it looks like i'm touching i'm touching the you know this the information i'm touching the ui and 
he kind of like smiled because he knew like you picked up on this detail, like the physicality of the, the artifacts of the pickles, pixels, the pickles, the pixels had disappeared. <laughs> no more pickles in the iPhone. And I think that we, we, obviously this is version one of this thing. So who knows when we get to the, the, the equivalent of the version four, where it really does start to feel like just the information in front of you. Yeah. And I, I you know, look at the original Macintosh, right? Or like that classic that your family started with, right? Like nobody, almost nobody would consider that an acceptable form factor today, (laughs) right? A black and white nine inch screen that has to be plugged into the wall. And even when you do unplug it from the wall weighs 25 pounds. Uh, Nobody would consider that an acceptable Macintosh computer today. And it's like, I, you know, I, I, I tried to get at this in my review, but like eventually we will look at this set of Vision Pro goggles and see, well, that was completely unacceptable as, <laughs> as a form factor. But the platform is here. Yeah. Right. The pr- it, it, yeah. The proof of concept is so strong already. Uh, let me ask you this. Here's something I didn't. I I don't think I touched on in my review because I don't think it hit me until afterwards and sort of picking it up from other people's reviews and the, it, to me, like, especially with this device, like when it's just a new iPhone, which I don't mean to, to diminish with the word just, but you know, we're up to, you know, iPhone 15. I mean, there've been a lot of them. Mm. I don't feel, uh, uh, lonely being in that week period where I have a review unit and most of the people I know don't have one yet. And, Mm. you know, and part of it is that I'm such good friends with some of my fellow reviewers like Joanna Stern and Neelai Patel. Um, and so I do have people to talk about, you know, if it's, you know, like when Touch ID is new or the, the, the dynamic island or something like that. And it feels like being able to talk to like two or three other people for the week is like, ah, that's good. But with this product, I couldn't wait. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so special. I got a review unit a week of everybody else, you know, look at me, look at me. In fact, it just felt very lonely. I couldn't wait for everybody else to start getting them <laughs> because it's like, I need other people to, to actually be able to say, yes, I know. I know yeah. what you mean, right? I needed yes. that so badly with this. Yeah. And, but one of those aspects is it just didn't hit me until after I wrote my entire review that one of the weirdest things about this product is that fake reality that you immerse yourself in looks far more realistic than actual pass through reality. Yeah. Right. And it's because the virtual reality, like if you just use the immersive surroundings thing and say, okay, put me on the moon, they've either photographed or I guess with like the moon rendered this stuff, you know, at the highest resolution possible. Um, and when you do the dino- encounter dinosaurs, right, it's all 3D rendered at the highest possible fidelity. Or you look at the documentary they f- they have of the woman on the tightrope up on top of a mountain. It, well, that was shot with crazy expensive, like, 8K cameras or something. Like, multiple 8K cameras to get all of the, the, the 180-degree immersion. Whereas when I look at real reality around me with these, I'm looking at through these sort of effectively like cell phone quality cameras that have to go do the pipeline processing through the R1 chip in this crazy small amount of time. And so it just is backwards from what you would expect. You would just expect, well, reality surely is the easy part and virtual reality is the hard part, but it's the opposite. And Mm. I find that very, now that I've, I've noticed it, it's, it's constantly disconcerting to me. Hmm. That's interesting. So you're finding that synthetic environments feel more real to you. Right. Than the Even though I know they're the, not. Yeah. I don't think that I have the same experience and it might just because of my own knowledge of how those synthetic environments are made. Um, cause those are all gen, gen those are all computer generated. I'm, you know, I'm fairly certain those are all modeled. 
like the moon the you know joshua tree and those might be an exception i'm not i'm not sure but or some kind of mix of rendering versus yeah totally photography um you like high really high res with depth mapping so that everything parallaxes when you move your head back and forth um but it i feel like there's a higher bar to get to like super plausibility for me because i'm used to artifacts in my life like i feel like we're we've we're I, I thought that we were all kind of like this is that we're so used to observing the world through cameras, through lenses and sensors that we're comfortable with the, um, the degradation of the, of, of, you know, it's all mediated through a degraded capture process. So like I buy into that, my, my brain connects to that reality and calls it, Oh, that's reality. And so I, I, I don't, think I value necessarily the synthetic environments as much as just being able to pass through and see an approximation of my real reality. To me, that's the mind blower. And even the much, much worse version of it in the MetaQuest 3, which is like full color, but all warpy and everything, a lot lower res. To me, that's still plausible reality. And it's like, okay, I would take that over being closed off from the whole world. Hmm. But, but I, I think that's interesting. I, to your point about loneliness, it's really important to be able to communicate and share these experiences with the device or with the tech early on with other people who are in there and feeling what you feel. That's like kind of the most valuable thing for me right now too. I got on, I don't know, my, my, one, my co-founder, Beamer, he got he got one on the same day and we're just like spending all day in, in it and like FaceTiming and stuff and, and working together. I got one for sandwich so that our visual effects supervisor could be using it and because we're developing an app for it and so that we could see the same thing. Because if we're going to be rendering um, CG th- models for this app, it's not okay to just do it in the simulator. Like he needs to feel what I feel and what the user is going to feel. And I think... Every time I've, sh- I've been able to give the guest mode tour to a few people. And every time you get that joy of unlocking it, unlocking the experience for somebody who didn't know what, what to expect. Have you, have you done guest mode with like for Amy and, and others? Yeah. Well, yeah. just Amy really so far. Yeah. Um, and on the one hand, and she was really worried about it because she has uh, like the way her vision has always worked her whole life, her two eyes together, uh, well, for example, go back to the '90s. Remember when there was that stereoscopic poster craze? Yeah, Magic you know, Eye. Yeah, Magic Eye posters. Um, she could never see them. She, mm. she, and she. Does she have two left eyes. I don't know why that's funny it, to me. Like, <laughs> it's sort of like that, right? It's like she, you know, her vision is fine like in both eyes, you know, with glasses, but she just has trouble seeing 3D stuff. Sure, and yeah. like when she tried my quest she saw double right away Mm. and i don't know there might have been a way to adjust that i don't don't know but when she tried this in guest mode um she did not see double and expected to Mm. and that was with my corrective lens inserts which i think are a little too strong for her but uh but she liked it but but on the other hand i kind of feel like guest mode is a pain in the ass like it is a pain in the ass for sure I don't know what they were thinking. Like, <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like there's some easy fixes for it, but like the big problem is you. So your device is your Vision Pro is tied to you, and it uses Optic ID, which is like Face ID or Touch ID, to unlock things automatically, and your keychains lock to it. And for the most part, like if somebody just picks up your Vision Pro and tries to put it on. They're, they either need to have your eyeballs for optic ID or they need to know your numeric passcode for the device. So it's just like trying to use somebody's iPhone without their face. You need mm-hmm. their code or you need their face. And with you put it in guest mode in control center and it's not too hard to put it in. And they're like, but then there's like a prompt, like which apps do you want them to have access to so that, you know, they can't look at your email or something. Maybe you just want to give them permission to use the dinosaur adventure thing. Mm -hmm. And then you take it off and give it to them. And 
if they take it off for even a minute, then it locks again and they have to give it back to you and you have to go through the whole thing all over again, put it back into guest mode and then sure. hand it back to them. Yeah. It's, it it's, really a, dis- it's a bummer when the, when it, when the flow gets disrupted, this is what I've done every time, which is uh, like, first you turn on mirroring. Cause I, so like, let's say I have my Mac or I have an Apple TV. I mirror what I'm seeing so that they can see it. And then I just say, you tap your fingers together like this. You select something like this. You bring up the home screen like this. And I select apps. And then let me show you a couple things. And I'll moving this, you know, I'll just do like a quick demo, maybe minute and a half. And then I leave mirroring on. That's really important. So you can see what they're seeing. And then you go, and then they go through the setup flow. And unfortunately there's that friction because it needs to calibrate to their eyes in order to right. work. Otherwise, it's going to be a terrible experience for them. So yeah, like Apple had a challenge in this guest mode thing. To me, I've had a good experience with it so far, except for the one time that mirroring stopped, and then I wasn't able to explain to the to the guest what to do next, you know, because I couldn't see what they what they saw. But and then there's like the uncomfortableness of handing over your unlocked device to somebody, you know, and just, you know, that's all my, that's all my stuff. You know, I don't, don't, okay. Promise you won't go through my stuff. Um, but yeah, I think the benefits far outweigh the friction for me right now. Cause this, I don't know. It's almost like they see what you see and suddenly you're able to speak. So like you, you get a shared vocabulary from it and it's no right. longer. So because, so um, Roxana, my partner, it was a few days that I had the Vision Pro at home and I was using it in front of the family, regrettably, um, you know, because I looked like such a super dork. And, you know, like I, I just had to like, ple- you know, I just had to beg, like, just let me live this. This is, the, this is one of the most important things that's happened in tech in my life in a, in a long time. Let me, let me have this. And then I promise I'll let you in on, you know, what's going on. And she wasn't that curious about trying it out, but eventually we're sitting there in, in, in bed. And I said, do you want the demo now? And she said, sure. We realized that if you're on the outside of this thing, there's not, I can't think of a different, another technology where the chasm between how cool it is to the person using it, um, and how lame it is for anybody not using it is so wide. I can't think of another thing like that. And it's even so hard to reproduce in right. media for anybody to understand. And that's really regrettable. But when they cross that chasm, it's so huge. It's very valuable. And now they, now they, you know, something clicked the first time Roxana got the demo and the moment where it actually did click for her, other than moving windows around and seeing in stereo it's showing her a spatial video that I shot from Christmas morning with our new puppy. And then she's like, Oh, (laughs) you know, now I get it. And that was all that had to happen. Yeah, it is. And do you find yourself, I find myself continuously and poor Amy is my victim because Jonas is off at college. Um, where I keep wanting to say to her over and over again, and this is now over two weeks running come here and look at this. And I expect that if she's over my shoulder, that I can point at what I'm seeing that is really cool and that she'll see it because I'm, I'm otherwise I'm in the kitchen. She sees the same refrigerator that I see. Hmm. She sees the same kitchen counter that I see, but she doesn't see this cool window (laughs) of content that I see that is right here. And I cannot get it through my head because I keep it. It's, because again, it comes back to this uh, level of immersiveness and not the immersiveness in a fake world, like the mountaintops or the surface of the moon, but the immersiveness of these windows seem like they really are in the room that I'm in. Yeah. Um, like right now talking to you, I'm down here in my basement podcast studio. I haven't dialed up any immersion. I'm just, it just looks like my cluttered junkie full of boxes basement, you know? Right. Um, but I, I, it, it's um it's almost unfathomable to me that if somebody c- came and stood behind my shoulder that they wouldn't see you yeah it's you know it's i i'm in the same i'm in the same place like you there's this sense of a shared experience that is really important to this device and i think that i think that the device really takes flight or this platform really takes flight when two people can be in the same space and actually have a shared space. Um, 
they, you know, what Apple calls the shared space right now is in vision OS when multiple apps can share space together in your field of view. And that's a very important version of shared space because that's something that none of the other VR or XR platforms have. That version of shared space is mind blowing. But what I really want is for me and my collaborator or friend to be in the same room. We're both wearing the thing and we decide what windows we want to look at together. That's going to be huge. Now there's approximations of that now with share play with, um, you know, that you can share your view in FaceTime. There's like baby steps to get there, but man, is that going to be sweet when we can, when we can look at the same windows in the same, in the same space, whether we're together or, or in, in, you know, remote. I can't wait for that reality. That's where, that's where it really levels up for me. And it, the other thing too, and it just makes me get lost in the possibilities of it is because there's, I can think of just off the top of my head, there's two very different ways to do that shared space thing. The one is if you and your colleague are literally in the same room together, mm-hmm. like you could reach out and touch each other. Mm-hmm. And then you'd want to have a shared window that you both see in the shared space as appearing at the exact same position at the exact same size. Mm -hmm. And then there's, well, what if you're, what if you're in Los Angeles and your pal Gruber's in Philadelphia and we bring up a window that we're both looking at, how does that work? Where it can't possibly be in the same space because we're not in the same space, but we're sharing the window at the same time, you know? And like, if I resize it, do you see it resized too? That's a good question. I mean, we could literally try it right now. We could, in a FaceTime call, you can share any window. Well, maybe we shouldn't because it'll break our entire intricate setup for recording this thing. (laughs) We'll do it another time. But I think that that kinds of that kind of thing is something like again. That's just like a UI pattern that we're going to get used to doing. Is like just like attaching a photo to a text message or something. That's not that's not something that was easy when we all first got the the phone, and now it's second nature. Yeah, and I guess one of the apps that I've spent, I, I like opened it up and poked around a little, but I guess that's maybe what Freeform is there for, right? Yeah, it's um, shared canvas. You know, it almost makes me wonder. And, and every time Apple comes out with a new device, I think people sort of go backwards in time years and think, "Oh, is that why Apple did X, Y, and Z?" You know, <laughs> years ago, mm-hmm. like did the did the iPad cursor support start with this device? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think so. But I think maybe Freeform did, right? That Freeform as a concept for an app might have started with this team. And they were like, well, let's, you know, let's build it for the phone and Mac and iPad first, and then we'll ship it for this. But That's a great theory. I, I love it. And there's all kinds of like handoff stuff and universal control stuff that, the concept have been proved has been proven across other devices and now is making its way into this device and is really usable. It's like right. really fluid. Just, you know, I, do you have your virtual Mac up right now? I do. Right. So I do too. And just like using the trackpad and floating the, the cursor off the screen and into one of my vision windows and it works flawlessly and say, same with the keyboard. Um, they're not messaging that in, in any in any way when you when you get onboarded to this thing, but right. the fact that we can just figure it out and like that's again that's just like mind blowing that they, <laughs> they that, that they can do that. Not only are all these windows able to exist in the same space, and that is literally spatial computing, but we're actually bringing our devices from outside of this space and inviting them into the space and able to interoperate with them. Yeah. Holy shit. Can you believe that? <laughs> All right. Let me take a break here okay. and uh, bring this back to a normal episode of the show and thank one of our sponsors, our good friends at Trade Coffee. You can give the gift give the gift of better coffee for Valentine's Day this year. Trade Coffee is here to help you show your significant other friends and family some love with a highly personalized gift catered to their taste. Trade is the the destination for better coffee at home. You can subscribe to Trade and start the year with better coffee or gift it to somebody who you love for Valentine's Day, whatever, um, for you, for somebody else. 
Uh, but you will discover new favorites. You will support over 55 local roasters across the United States who all contribute. That's They're the sort of partnership that trade sources their coffee from. It's from 55, over 55 now, local roasters across the country. And just upgrade your morning routine. The best part is you can personalize everything from the type of coffee you get to how often you get it delivered in what size. Uh, it's absolutely perfect. I've been subscribed for years now and don't know what I would do without subscription coffee other than run out of coffee <laughs> and annoy myself, uh, every couple weeks. Um, it is just great. It is high quality coffee, uh, from a bunch of local roasters and you can personalize it to your taste and preferences. As the coffee comes in, you get like an email from them a couple days later. It says, hey, how'd you like that coffee you got last week? Give it a thumbs up, give it a thumbs down. And it dials in the sort of coffee they deliver to you on your schedule based on your reaction to the ones you've had before. It really is. It's great coffee, great service, and you're supporting local roasters. So show your loved ones how much you care with the gift of Trade Coffee for Valentine's Day. Right now through February 14th, Trade is offering 10 bucks off gift subscriptions when you use the code the talk show 10 the talk show 10 the talk show 10 at checkout that's the talk show 10 to receive 10 bucks off gift subscriptions use code the talk show 10 at checkout amazing there there's so much to talk about with this thing and i've made a lot of notes but i think yeah, what one, do you want to start with? One well, cool thing to talk about. We went, we were just sort of talking about space and sh you know, sharing space. Um one thing that I've noticed now after a week is the space that you're using it in makes a difference, right? So I was I I got to participate in a developer lab because like like I mentioned we're making an app. Uh, Sandwich is making an app for for this thing, hopefully launching in like a week or so. Can we talk so, about it or is it secret until it launches? It's secret until launch, but it's in the media video right. space and it's, and it's fun, but, um, well, I know what it is. You know what it is. <laughs> and, um, but I don't, I will, I will pretend that I don't. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's super fun, but we're still like polishing it, polishing the video and stuff. Um, the launch video. So when I went to the developer lab and you know, they, don't talk about developer lab. The one thing I can say is that when they put you in a cubicle, basically you're sitting there and you're, so the first time you experience vision OS is in a very confined space. Um, you're, you're, you've got a studio to display in front of you. And I think that's all I'll say, except that the idea of using vision OS at a cubicle is Def definitely not the the ideal environment for using spatial computing. So then, it you know the real one delivers to my home, and now I get to use it in my living room, which is the ideal. That's exactly what, where I want it to be perfect, and it was. You know, you need to be able to throw windows into the distance and prioritize them based on the, the closest closeness to you, and to be able to scale them up and down based on what you need in in your foreground and your focus. Um, but then, uh, a couple of days ago, I took it to the office so that we, to, to the sandwich office so that we could have, we could do some like TikTok uh, content about it. And our office is a big open loft space and it was an entirely different experience using it in there. I, I, that was something that I wasn't expecting. And really this thing is designed in such a way that it benefits from, having openness around you. Cause like the more openness it's like it, it's it, the analogy to a screen is, is kind of perfect. You know, even though there's no screen, the screen becomes the space that you're in. Um, and that is, su that is really, re that that's something that I didn't expect. Yeah. Do you think that it's sort of disappointing in so far as that, it sounds, before you've used it, it sounds like a product and a platform where it's great if you have limited physical space, if you have a tiny apartment or a tiny mm -hmm. dorm room or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and now you can create a virtual environment, you know, 
uh, and spread out. But the truth is, it actually, I think it's better. That's why I use it in my kitchen a lot, because our mm-hmm. kitchen is a big, airy, open room. And it just somehow feels better there. Mm-hmm. Um, I almost feel like maybe that's part of the point of making the virtual environment such a top level part of the system is yes. that, okay, if you are in a physic, f- your real room is cramped, you're going to, you're going to want to use a virtual immersion to feel like you can spread out. I think that's such a good insight. I think what we really want, and this is an elemental thing that we, what humans really want is the sense of scale of the world or the universe around us. Like that's what makes us feel that's what makes us feel in, I don't know. What is it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the right language. To, that's what makes us feel great, right? Is when we, when we can look up into the sky and sort of like know that we exist as part of this huge system. And it's like, that is why scale is important. Um, I know that like, if I can look, look out over the lake, you know, the, the, the virtual lake and put a screen out there far in the distance, that's going to be a very meaningful, impactful um, experience for me. And it's going to be different from being in my cramped room and throwing a, you know, a sort of screen against the wall or whatever. And it's like not that far from me. Now I can push it out further past the wall. And when it like, you know, it's, it's that really cool spatial computing does, you know, design choice that they've made where if the window that I'm pushing away from me, knows exactly how far that wall is and when it comes up against the wall it starts to fade out right and i can i can keep pushing it away from me and it's scaling up but now it's 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 mostly transparent because it doesn't want me to put that window beyond the wall because that physically doesn't make sense um i love that they've thought of that but the constraint doesn't happen. The fade doesn't happen if you're in a giant room or if you're actually right. looking out into the world. So I think scale is so important to this, uh, to this, you know, to this OS. And I don't know. It's just it's something that I guess I, d- I didn't expect. Um, another another thing, just talking about space and scale and windows and stuff. The what you would expect to happen is when you if you take a window and you you bring it close to your face, you would expect that the scale of the window stays consistent. So let's say it's a hundred inch window and you bring it right up close to your face, you would think it stays a hundred inches and now it's taking up a huge amount of your field of view. But what they're actually doing is they're scaling it down to compensate for the distance from your eyes. So it's actually doing this as you push it out, it's scaling up as it gets further from you. So it's taking up the exact same field of view. Is that something that you want? I don't know. I like our own, my own app that I'm developing. It doesn't work like that. Actually, if you push something out, it it keeps its own scale. And that's actually a very enjoyable experience to have things feel like they're more physical because they're they're constrained and their scale doesn't change. Does that make sense the way I'm explaining it? Yeah, it's it's very hard for me to explain the way that the windows. I know exactly what you're saying. I can't say it better than you, but it's not what I expected, but I see why they did it that way. Yeah. And it's got this it's got this, you know what a dolly zoom is in, in yeah. movies? Right. It's got this dolly zoom effect or like the in the show Severance when he goes up and down in the elevator. Um, yeah. Do you, yeah. you know that you know the show? And I you love know when show when he's going up and down the elevator, when he gets to work and the, it does a Zolly, a Zolly or Dolly zoom effect where the focal length of the lens changes as the camera gets changes in distance from him. And it just has this weird sort of like time warpy effect for you when you move a window. I kind of love it, but I also kind of don't. That's something that I don't know. It's a, it's, it's really interesting. The, the, the way that that's, that that works. What do you think now that we're like, what are we here? An hour ish in. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is, I don't know that I want to do this every week or every episode of the show. Like there's, I have mixed feelings the about persona it so far. thing. Yeah. But oh, on no, a, great. Let's talk about persona. <laughs> but agree. on the one hand, it does feel and sound like the most intimate, 
episode of the show I've ever done. Yeah. Other than the ones I've been, I've actually recorded in person with somebody. Right. Cause you never like, do remote video with, with the show. You've never no, done it. Almost just never. For, only yeah. like occasionally like during COVID with the, the Apple people. Right. Right. It's a totally different experience recording a podcast with somebody on, and looking at each other on video. Um, yeah, but this is very different than using Zoom or Face, you know, regular FaceTime. Totally, it, it's it is far more intimate, and the sound too. Like this, the you know, I've got AirPods Pro in, so I'm still getting spatial audio, but mm -hmm. you don't sound like Adam in my headphones. You sound like Adam somehow here in front of me. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, we say we sound very present with each other, and it's very intimate, and it's. I don't hate it. It's just like, it's a lot. It's like a high intensity experience. And I think, yeah, like there's something to be said for just getting on the phone and, and chatting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's something about, there's something to be said for a low fidelity connection. It just like, I don't know what it is. It allows the other senses to sort of extend themselves to, to the, to make the connection. And right now all of the, all of the senses are extended like our senses are in the same room. Right. It's like somehow m m by far more infinite than any remote episode of the show I've ever done, mm. but at the same time, exhausting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. Well, well, you know, I can back off. Um, you can, you can put, take, I wonder what it feels like to like put, just push your window away. Now you're bigger and you're further away from me. I don't know. I have been playing around with while we're talking. I've been playing around with moving in and out of the moon. And it's yeah. interesting what it does to the audio. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because it sort of isolates you because right. there's no sound bouncing around in the in the moon. And which is something that the Vision OS actually does, which is that it treats your audio as though it's bouncing off of all of the surfaces of this room. Right. And Which now that I'm, I've just dialed up the moon again, and now it's it's even more. Again, it's not like you're a voice in my headphones. It's like you're a voice in a room, but there's like nothing else. Yeah, I'm in the moon. I'm on the moon now too. This is cool. I also find the I content two weeks in. I find the audio out of the built-in speakers on the headset to be startling. Yeah, and I know it's a visual device first. It's literally called Vision Pro, but. The audio is astonishing. It, it truly is. Um, there are something like six mics on the on the device, picking up sound in every direction, and and I believe, and the and you know these incredible directional speakers that sit right above your ears. Um, I wish that they figured out how to when you're using your Mac virtually. I wish that they could figure out how to route the sound back to the vision um, instead of just playing it out of your Mac speakers. Yeah. That would be cool. Um, oh, here's the other thing I noticed about sound that I made a note of is that all of the sound effects in the OS are like really rich and deep and sci-fi and cool sounding. But the one that is not is when you send a text message to someone and it goes, <laughs> it's that really thin whoosh th sound. And I don't know why, I, w I don't know why they thinned that out so much, but it's, it feels like a choice, you know? Huh. I just sent you a, a word that got misspelled by autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you, what, how do you feel about your persona? Like just, I don't know. Cause I don't see it. Yeah, you don't see it. I'm looking at two of you and one of me right now this whole time. Um, and I also realize that for anybody watching the personas on the on the YouTube, the video version, both of our eyes are shifting around a lot in a way that we would never be doing right. if we were just looking at each other on right. Zoom. Right. Because we're, like, we're in computer space right now. Right. But I know that you're looking around your environment, so I don't think it's weird. I think it's going to be, it's going to look like we're glitching to people who are watching the video, but it doesn't seem unnatural to me that you're not holding my gaze for over an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, good. Uh, all right. I, I'm going to take another break here and thank sure. our next sponsor. It's our, the second and final sponsor of the show, and it's our good friends at Squarespace. Um, uh, Look, you guys know Squarespace. They're the all-in-one 
website making platform. You need a website or you have an old website that you want to replace with a new website. You can go to Squarespace and do everything from domain name registration to picking a template to start with your design or starting from scratch with your own custom design or uh, you name it visually adding the features you want to your website. Do you need a store? Do you need a blog? Do you want to host a podcast? Uh, do you have other ideas? Are you, is it a restaurant? Do you want to put a menu up on your website? Anything like that. You do it all in Squarespace visually on the web you just log in with your admin interface, make the website the way you want it to look. And then when it's ready to go, that's exactly what you see as the creator is what the public sees when they go to your website. Uh, their new Fluid Engine, which is their name for the design engine that you make your website in Squarespace, uh, is so amazing even on a phone that you cannot believe that you're dragging and dropping and making a web interface for like that works on desktop computers on a four and a half inch, five inch phone. It's so amazing. Um, but anything. So if you just need to make a tweak, you could do it on your phone. If you're the sort of person who does uses your phone as your primary computer, do it all right there on the phone on your tablet, on your iPad, wherever you want to do it, or, you know, the old fashioned way on a big Mac with a big screen, all of it works great. Um, everything online store, flexible payments, uh, more, uh, analytics all built in. It is just the best way to make a website. You get 30 days free, no credit card required upfront. Just go to squarespace.com slash talk show. And, that lets them know you came from this show. And w when your 30 day demo is up, uh, just go back to squarespace.com slash talk show and you get 10% off your first payment, which can be for up to an entire year prepaid, save 10% just by going to squarespace.com slash talk show. Great. Can we talk about the home screen? Yeah. Let's talk about this is what I this if if we're if we're sort of like coming to the to 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 the final act of the episode I want to talk about the 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 home screen and the OS and sort of like the software experience of it and then broaden it out to where it fits in that language where it fits into the all the other Apple devices that there are and see if we can come to some sort of conclusion of meaning of of where this fits for the world, but just starting with that, that home screen, what's, what's that like for you? The, the fact that it's early days, that it's that set of app icons that you can't reorder, you know, the way it moves, the way it feels, the, the constraints of it, what it doesn't have, you know, no dock, that kind of thing. What's, what's, what's your assessment so far of the home screen? Uh, I think it's kind of surprising. You can't reorder it at all. Like it's, it's arguably the most beta ish feeling thing of the whole system. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, I'm kind of used to it, yeah. you know? And so what happens as you install more apps is they just get installed like that first home screen you don't get to play with that's mm -hmm. Apple's apps. And then everything else you install just gets sorted in alphabetical order after that. Yeah. Um, which is kind of crap because sometimes your favorite apps, you right. know, are, lo are later in the alphabet. My my app starts with a T, uh, so that's a problem. But I think right. reordering is probably coming. I also sort of wonder whether, similar to the watch, uh, you know, it's it's been years and years. I think it's, it hasn't been since the first watch that I actually had um, the grid view of of the the app home screen instead of list view, but you can also use an iPhone app, the watch iPhone app to reorder your, to reorder your apps or remove some of the icons or whatever, um, or just take apps off of your, off of your watch. So I wonder if there's maybe like uh, an intermediary solve is whether there's like, if there's an, an app on the iPhone or something that allows you to reorder or manage your, your vision OS apps it might hmm. be kind of a cool solution. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. What do you think about it so far? And I guess the other thing is that there aren't that many apps that I have yet. Right. You know, 
But it's like on the one hand, they do want to brag that there are 600 native apps in the store. and Sure, but they're all thousands. in that one folder for <laughs> iPad compatible apps, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I don't know. I, I find myself most often invoking apps just with Siri because um, it's kind of, it's a little bit of friction to navigate over in the home screen and, um, you know, and then select from that folder. And But the ones I'm coming back to over and over again are like, slack and calendar and things that things are aren't are native in vision yet but but there's an ipad version and it's kind of well, it's not weird but it's different than the other platforms that there's no dock where you can put your most used apps right yeah which i don't i don't know what's coming there i the the other thing i i mean i don't mind it i i like it it's just like it's not something that i'm interacting with all the time um because most of the most of the things, if they require your attention, they'll just come to you, right? You'll get a little notification or whatever, and then you can easily. And I think the premise is that you can just like keep a lot of windows open at the same time, and then just turn your head wherever you need, yeah, you know, access to that app. Which is, I mean, it's you think of it, it's like it's connected to the Mac in that way that it's the only other device that has multi app like this kind of multi app use for. Yeah, for, for uh, multi-purpose uh, at the same time, uh, where stuff is side by side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like it. You know, visually, it's. I re- didn't realize this until until a few days in, but spiritually, it's the, it's the most similar to the watch, um, the watch home screen, right? In in the way that it looks, you know, the iconic way, the circles that are staggered, and I think it's a cool visual effects a visual effect how you swipe left and right in the home screen and some rows move slower than the middle row. And they, they, they sort of like defocus on the edges. Um, it's, it's really interesting, um, in that way. Um, I don't know. I I'm into it. I don't think that there would be a better, I don't, I can't think of a better way to manage your apps for this thing. Um, I think it's interesting, and I keep calling it a home screen too, but it, they call it the home view because oh, really? it's not a screen. Yeah. It's just sort of a view that gets overlaid over whatever's in front of you right now. You mm-hmm. know, And I guess that's sort of the thinking is that the whole home view sort of is the dock. Mm-hmm. It's just a dock with everything. You know, um, I, I don't know. It's Again, it's just one of those things where it is... Like our biggest complaint, or at least, you know, the most obvious complaint is that you can't reorder the apps or customize the order. And I don't know what the answer is to that. You know, presumably I would think it would just be like the iPhone where you put them into jiggle mode with a long press or something. Sure. Um, Maybe they have more ambitious, maybe they have a much more ambitious idea. I don't know. And it's, you know, but it's, it is the sort of thing that i find myself losing half an hour of time just thinking about and i'll just sit there and play with it and slide it back and forth right Mm -hmm. like i don't want to do it right now i'm a little uh uh i i I just don't want to screw up this call you know what i mean it's it's like i I, because i do find myself occasionally screwing things up right do you find that sometimes like for example i find myself closing safari tabs when i want to activate them because the tab is relatively small and the button is part of the tab and so it's pretty easy to be looking at the close button when you want to close the tab yeah uh, uh or when you just want to activate the tab and right. there's a, a couple of other things and it you know gets back to your point that Marco mentioned where it's like it's almost like i f- feel so comfortable basically with the look and look look at it with my eyes tap it with my index finger and thumb that I, I went from feeling, oh, this is weird and novel. I better go slow. That lasted only, that only lasted like a minute back in June mm-hmm. when I had my first demo at WWDC. And every experience since, I feel like I want to, I feel like a precocious child who wants to impress the teacher <laughs> by racing ahead and yeah. zipping through this interface as fast as I can. But the truth is, I can think faster 
then my eyes can stay on the same target while my fingers tap. Right. And so that thing Marco said, I, and I've seen other people in their reviews mention it is you look at the button and you know, you want to tap it and you see that it's highlighted and your fingers start to do the tap and your eyes are already moving on to the next thing you want to do. And then your eye went by the time your fingers actually tap, your eyes are somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and so it is, I, I guess that's, I don't know why I'm bringing it up in the context of the home screen or home no, view, but no, it's all but, right. It's, it's all in the same category of just like, how do we manage all this stuff and move around in it? And to, I mean, like to me, it connects to the home screen because, or the home view, because something that I'm doing in the Mac and the iPhone, iPad, whatever is constantly switching between apps. And I find that without a keyboard, there's just no great way to do that, to, to do app switching. Like I'm, I'm command tabbing and Mac. That's probably the thing I do most in the Mac is command tab. And there's not any, or in the iPhone, you're, you're doing the bottom up gesture to switch between apps doing that constantly. So there's not a good gesture yet for doing that, for doing app switching like that. I mean, like uh, apparently it's coming in the next, or it's in the next, the beta of the next uh, uh, OS update, but to just automatically bring your, you know, the app that you've just selected back into, into the foreground, that's a pretty important thing to do in terms of app switching. Um, The thing that changes the game for me, and I think it's almost like important for anybody to know this who's thinking about using a vision pro is like getting a met like a small magic keyboard is a game changer especially for safari i find like yeah. for closing tabs for opening new ones for going directly to the url bar is just going to be at least three times faster to do all that stuff than doing it with your eyes and your fingertips right and as big and bulky as this headset is in the the travel case is, do you have the, did you get the Apple travel case? I did. Yes. It's beautiful. Were you surprised by how big it is? Um, I expected it. I've got a medic, a case from the medic quest and I, and like, I kind of know that just like to fit all of it in there, it's gotta be that big for the configuration. It is very nice though, right? Yeah. Uh, It's It's super nice. Such high quality. And feels sort of futuristic. I mean, and again, I haven't taken it out of the house yet, so I don't know how it, you know, my, my observation and my review is using a white fabric seemingly means it's going to get scuffed up and dirty by sticking it underneath airplane seats. And <laughs> yeah. Train no, I think seats. it's pretty resistant to dirt and stains and stuff. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It kind of, I always joke, do you ever see that picture of the Pope? It was a, a, like an AI deep fake. Oh, you should pull Balenciaga. Yeah. Yeah. It made him look like he was wearing this super cool. And it's like, well, why doesn't the Pope have a cool winter coat like that? He kind (laughs) of should. Right. Um, But it looks like it's made out of what I imagine that imaginary white puffy coat fabric to be made out of. Yeah. It's so NASA. It's super spacey. Yeah. NASA. Right. It it seems astronauty as, as we're talking here on the surface of the moon. Yeah. I love it. And, um, I came back out into my room cause I didn't, I was getting bored of the moon. Like I, I I'm a real world man, but any, I, I do wish that the, <laughs> I, I want a case that has space for the magic keyboard. I tried to get one of those tiny Bluetooth, like HTPC yeah. thumb keyboards, but it just wasn't, wasn't doing it for me. You really, cause you really need to like look at those things in order to type with them. But, um, a small, like I feel the magic keyboard is tiny in size. It's lightweight. And it's got a full configuration of the keyboard layout and, and you can, you know, you can hide windows and close tabs and type way, way, way easier than with the virtual right. keyboard. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I love my mechanical keyboards and it's funny sure. cause I have an old key cron one. I don't want to spend time bitching about it, but I, <laughs> I spent a surprisingly, it's Bluetooth, which is why, you know, most mechanical keyboards require a wire, but I guess the, they're sort of catching up to the world where most of them, or at least most of the newer ones have Bluetooth too. But this key cron K2 that I've had for, I don't know, five or six years now, maybe longer. Um, is the only Bluetooth mechanical that I have in the house. Jonas took a bunch of my other ones with him to college, mm-hmm. but I couldn't get it to pair with this. 
even though like I've paired the magic keyboard and uh, I'm 98% sure the problem is I eventually did enough research that the Keychron I have only supports Bluetooth 3.1 hmm. and Bluetooth now is up to like five point something or maybe even six. And I think that's what it is. I think vision hmm. OS doesn't support Bluetooth older than some cutoff and this keyboard, even though it works with all my phones and iPads and Macs, whatever. Mm -hmm. But as much as I'm a fan of mechanical keyboards, I do have to admit that imagining traveling with this headset, the magic keyboards, almost insane light weight is like, it, it, it's like, you can't imagine Apple's I never, and I never really thought about it before, but it, it, you almost wouldn't want it to be any lighter weight. Right. No. It, it would almost, it would be like you, you could blow on it. It would blow around like a sheet of paper. Right. I just want to be like, I throw it in my tote bag cause I bring it around with me in, my, in the Mac, but I, I would love an all in one, but you know, it's just like, it, I didn't, I didn't re appreciate how crucial an accessory it's, it was going to be for the vision pro cause yeah. the virtual keyboard as great as it is for when you don't, when you don't have anything else and maybe when, you don't want to, you don't want to dictate it, uh, you know, virtual keyboard, you can figure it out. You can peck, hunt and peck. You can look at keys and, t and tap. It's way slower and, and that's fine. Like how else are they going to solve for that? I, 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 I would hope that people don't think, oh, I can't use a physical keyboard because it's a step back. It's not native to this tech. I absolutely think it is just like it's a keyboard is important for a Mac. Yeah, I almost feel like it's just uh, it's it's not worth worrying about. I mean, I, if they have some theoretical P Panzerino and I in the last episode of the show were talking about like um, that that there might be some you know uh, the the way everybody imagined virtual keyboards would work would be to project one onto a tabletop mm -hmm. in front of you, you know, mm -hmm. or to it, it, you could set up a, a tray, you know, the the food tray on your airplane and tell the device project a virtual keyboard in front of you and then you could just type on that uh, you know uh, that's an obvious idea right i mean it's been in science fiction movies everybody can you know so maybe apple's been working on it maybe there's somebody's there making progress on it maybe that's a pipe dream and that for multiple reasons would will never actually work because you don't get any physical feedback from it right you you know it, even the slightest click to keys is sort of important to the feel of typing. Um, but I think getting caught up on the fact that you can't natively type well, I don't think, you know, you know, somebody will have a typing contest with this thing eventually. And yeah. some kid is going to type at an astonishing rate just by staring. Yeah. I saw the, one. There was what, there was a typing contest on oh, um, already <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. And somebody, somebody was, was uh yeah pro, uh prodigi prod, prodig, prodigy prodigious yeah <laughs> at it um yeah I, I one of my favorite things to do with the Vision Pro is just use my Mac in it and there's a keyboard there right in front of me and yeah there's plenty of solutions to that problem uh, um, I guess where I'm going though is it that you that you most people need a physical keyboard to really do actual writing work with this thing that's not worth worrying about that much more than the fact that we need actual speakers uh, on the headset to hear each other and that there need to be two 4k displays in the headset in front of our eyes for us to see the world around us like the keyboard is just a part of the physical nature of the device yeah i agree 100 percent um yeah it's i do find this is this is one of my nits with the the current version of the os is that that virtual keyboard is always popping up in your face reminding yourself that it's there like even if you have a, a physical keyboard attached it should i wish that it was a little bit more intuitive about knowing that because anytime there's a text field the, vir the 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 virtual keyboard is right there blocking my view no, I know exactly what you mean. When the when that virtual keyboard, and I don't know why. Sometimes I don't even know why. Sometimes mm -hmm. I do know why. I'll be like, oh, I was looking at the, uh, or like in the messages, right? There's the little text box at the bottom of the window where you've put the input focus when you want to type 
a message to somebody in messages and you're like, oh, I just wanted to move the window around, but I looked up a little too much and and I saw the text field highlight and then I tap my fingers and now I'm stuck with this keyboard I don't want. But then there's other times where the keyboard pops up and I don't even know why. I, don't, I can't even imagine what it was I was looking at that made it look up. Yeah. I, and also, I mean, it's very intrusive, but also I can't figure out what the purpose of the text preview is in the in the virtual keyboard. Oh, like why, I, why, why would I need that? Because what I'm typing is going into the field that I'm typing in. So I think that's about people who need to look at the keys on the physical keyboard. But that's the, there. there's a similar pop-up above the physical keyboard. Like it, it shows up above your MacBook keyboard if you pair your MacBook with your thing. That's right. And it's like having a, a the, the iPhone's autocomplete bar on a physical keyboard. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is to support people who look at the keys while they type. Fair enough. That's as good as, that's as good as any answer. And that's good enough for me. But it really, uh, this is where I'm, you probably don't remember such devices, but like when Amy and I were in high school, um, I, you know, I didn't have a computer at home. I had a word processor. Yeah. And the word processor was really a glorified typewriter. Mm -hmm. And mine only had like a one line LED display. So in other words, like the current line that I was typing, I could see, you know, like a almost like a calculator, black and white, very super fat pixel display. And then when I hit return, that line would get flushed from memory and clickety clack, 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 clack typed onto the piece of paper in the word processor and then move on to the next one. And I remember Amy in high school had a word processor with like a five line display Whoa. and it could save like a whole file at once in, uh, on an actual floppy disk, like in a word perfect document. So she, you, she could take it to like a PC and read it, but that's what it reminds me of that. You get like this sort of one line buffer of text right above the keyboard before you actually send it. But it does, it seems so anachronistic, right? It's, it's yeah. like, I'm, I'm throwing back to like a word processor. My parents got me like in 1989 for my sophomore year of high school for the sort of, you see one line of text before you actually commit it for lack of a better verb. Yeah. I think all it took was you using the word support for the people who need that style of typing. And, and I was sold. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what do you think about just for the last kind of topic? Why don't we go down the list of all the other Mac Mac products and figure out how it ties together? Cause or Apple products. Yeah. Cause that's, that's kind of like the big thesis that I was kind of coming to is that all of them come together. Every device in the ecosystem is sort of connected to this one in a, in an interesting way. Before we do that, let me, let me just, my, my, my last I have two grab bag topics yeah. before we get there. I think that's I a good it. final topic. Number one, okay. do you find it surprisingly hard to drink any kind of beverage while you use <laughs> yeah. this product? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I think, yeah, coffee cups, coffee mugs are hard as jo coffee mugs Joanna are Stern particularly hard noted that a wine glass is hard. So yeah, you, it seems like you're drinking water out of maybe like a, a smaller, a smaller like mouth hole. Right. Right now. Right. Yeah, my friend uh, Mike Davidson. You know Mike Davidson. Yeah, he sure. he got it, and it was like, how come you didn't tell me I should have bought bottled beer before <laughs> before getting it? <laughs> because like a long neck bottle works better than a than like a can or a uh, like a pint glass or something. Yeah, but like or a coffee back or like lots of crisp yeah. straws for your jumbo your your big gulps. I think that's what we're going to need in the future. But there's right? a real physical problem with the 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 way that the the headset comes forward from your face that you know uh, i guess the other gag everybody i don't know did you have an uncle like this everybody i knew had an uncle who would at some point in your childhood take you aside like at a family holiday gathering and say hey you know i don't know you know i don't i'm not telling your parents how to raise you or anything but you know you, it's incredibly rude for you to put your nose in a glass while you drink <laughs> And I was like, oh, I didn't know. I thought it was like, you know, elbows on the table or whatever. And then I would try to drink without putting my nose in the glass. 
<laughs> it's such a good uncle gag. <laughs> yeah, and it was my uncle, my mom's, my mom's uncle. Who actually did it was he was more like a great uncle or like a, whatever you call like the uncle equivalent of a cousin, yeah. Stash, a good good Ukrainian name. Uh, and then you know it took me like three three or four tries of, and then realized, and then I look over at him at the table and he's laughing at me, and I'm like, nice. <laughs> you know, but it but there is something to that, like the way that your nose does go into a glass inevitably as you drink from it, that is impossible while you wear this device out in front of your face. Yeah, the thing really protrudes, and like it's it's some I I don't know I've caught myself bumping it up against things. Uh, you know, not knowing that I was too like that close and it's, which the only reason I care about that is because the thing scratches easily and I don't want yeah. scuffs all over my, my dang yeah. computer. Yeah. Uh, the other, the other grab bag topic was the, the fact that there is a bit of light leak around your nose mm -hmm. all the time. And to me, again, this is another little thing I picked up from my in-store buying experience. Um, is and then this was from the guy at the store who had no idea who I was, just giving me the thing. And he's like, How's that fit? You know, and I was like, Yeah, I feel you know, it's good. And he's like, Do you see any light around the sides? I'm like, Nope. And he goes, I'll bet you, but he, he goes, You do see a little light around your nose. And I said, Yes. And I've been thinking about this with my review unit for like 10 days beforehand. And he goes, That's totally normal. You know, that's actually by design, it's, it's sort of an anti, uh, nausea thing it keeps you a little bit oriented and it also is an anti-fog thing you know that there has you know there's some kind of air gap so that the inside of this thing doesn't get hot and sweaty and foggy and nobody all the times i had all those demos in the media and apple you know with every product apple pr wants to present the product to reviewers you know in an optimal way and let you know everything you should expect. Nobody ever told me that, that yeah. there was, I thought it was like my weird big nose maybe or something, everybody I know. And then I, I've gotten so many texts from friends who got theirs, you know, afterwards. And they're like, do I have a bad light seal? I see light around my nose right. over and over and over again. I don't know. And it feels like a total, drop ball on Apple's part that they didn't emphasize clearly enough. And if they did, then I just completely missed it. That at least around your nose, there's supposed to be a little light leak. And you, I, I completely forget about it about 45 seconds into putting it on every single time, every yeah. single time I'm like, Oh, I see that little light leak around my nose. And within a minute, I, I don't notice it. I haven't thought about it. If talking to you here, until I've just looked at my notes where I was like, what was the other thing I wanted to make sure I brought up? And it was the light leak around the nose. Yeah. I never think about it either. Mostly because I come from the MetaQuest. Like I, I've been, I've been VR back. Uh, I've had the VR headsets back going to the Oculus DK one. And this one, the, the light leak around this device is so much less than it's so much better than any, but any of the others. So like, I don't know in the in the in the Meta Quest that you, you actually consider it a feature because a lot of times because there's no interoperability of the devices you're not getting notifications in the Meta Quest so right. a lot of times you just need to look down at your phone and you do it by like tilting up your head and you you glance through the hole in your all, the hole above your nose so I can see that being a feature I can see it also being very hard to message that for Apple. Uh, cause it sounds like it's bullshit. It sounds like they're yeah. taking a bug I, and calling it a feature, but that's exactly, that's exactly what I think. I think yeah. that they were, I think they probably, there's somebody at Apple who's listening to this podcast and they're like, yes, we had like 27 different meetings about whether we should mention the light leak around the nose or not. And that there were <laughs> people on both sides. And eventually somebody was like, no, let's just not talk about it. Cause it sounds like we're making excuses. Yeah. I, I think that's probably right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what else? Oh, I know. I the other thing is, I do want to get to your ecosystem question because sure. right? I do think that's a good. I, I think that's a great final one. But there's there's another thing that I kind of feel like where I'm, I'm going to go there. Where do you think this introduction would have been different if Steve Jobs were still around? Oh my god! Amazing question. Wow. Well. I think that he would have demoed it. You I know? do too. 
you know, not. I think I, they would still be doing on stage demos. I yeah, think I don't know. I, I, what, so I don't know too. what what they would have done during COVID. Uh, you know, would have had to be different. And then I think with I think he would have insisted they go back to the old way or the old way with some adjustments, but that there still would be live on stage events. Yeah, that's the way that Steve always was. He was he was he was so iconic for his ability to model an experience for the people that were supposed to understand it. And I don't think that he would have taken a, had a second thought about putting the thing on in front of an audience and then showing his persona off, even if it had limitations, uh-huh. he would have proudly shown that off. And because he's Steve with the reality distortion field, everybody would have lapped it up. Everybody, he's got an iconic presence. So it would have translated to the persona. Um, who knows whether they would still be doing, if Steve was around, if they'd be doing that more like very, very intricately crafted style of video presentation that they do now. I think a lot of that is just because Tim probably isn't the showman and demonstrational presenter that, that Steve was. And they know that like, you, you know, know, know thyself. So instead what Tim is able to bring together is this incredible operation where he ta- he sets up a story that takes you on a journey from person to person, you know, through, throughout the, the whole product, product experience takes you from space to space and flies it around. Like it's the future. Like there's like cameras are weightless. And, and, and I, I think that that is Tim's deal, but if Steve had demoed this thing, it would have been that much more, it would have seemed that much more re- miraculous when we saw it introduced. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and uh, until the Vanity Fair cover story dropped, um, there was this uh, repeated, endlessly since June, uh, I, uh, notion from the people who e- either d- deliberately just to be contrarians or whether they just honestly felt, I think this is this product is not a good idea – that they just kept saying over and over again that we've we haven't seen there's a reason why we haven't seen any Apple executives wearing this thing. You look ridiculous. They know you look ridiculous, so they're not even letting themselves be photographed. And I've mentioned this. Uh, I think I mentioned it with Panzerino last week, but it it still frustrates me because if you really think about the dynamics of how they unveiled it and how they hold events now, there's no context where that would have made any sense because they don't do live on stage demos. And when Tim Cook went to the hands-on area afterwards and was photographed in front of one, those, they weren't letting anybody try those, you know, those were just sort of, you know, hardware. So you could see the hardware and look at the band or, or whatever else, but it doesn't, it's not the sort of product where it makes sense. Like you, you could go out after you deliver the big keynote for the new iPhone and you go out to the hands-on area and there's hundreds and hundreds of media and photographers uh, it's a scrum for lack of a better word and they can make room for tim to come up and approach it and poke his finger at the new phone and and touch one of the buttons or something but with this device that doesn't make any sense you don't just touch it briefly or point at it or something you have to uh, there's no context for it only a live demo would have been a reason why you would have seen Apple, someone from an Apple executive doing it. And I think they, I think Steve Jobs definitely would have. I, I do. Yeah. And I'm not saying that they, sh- that that means that they should still be doing it. I just think, you know, when you've got the greatest live demo guy of all time, you're going to keep using him. Well, there was an earthquake just now in LA. <laughs> it's still going on. <laughs> you sure not to real? live up to the cliche or anything, but we're shaking. Okay. It's over. You all right? uh, that was Steve just sending a message. He yeah. agrees with us. He agrees with us. All right. Here's an, here's a specific thing that I think Steve Jobs would have presented very differently from Apple. Now, I think Apple is very, very shy about the external battery pack. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lauren Good from Wired had a story before it shipped where she was, she pointed out that in all of the photos they took of us in the media who got hands on demos two weeks, three weeks ago, that the Apple photographer who took those pictures 
for almost all of us strategically took it from the other side or, you know, the, 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 the cable was de-emphasized in everybody's picture and the actual battery pack was out of the frame. We were usually pictured from like mid chest up while Mm -hmm. the battery pack is on the ground. I think Steve jobs would have done like a, it's like jujitsu where he would have said this battery pack and and, you know, let me show you how, you know, how are we powering this incredible computer? Well, we're powering it with the best battery anybody has ever made. Yes. Look at it. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful, you know, and it is, it's kind of an ingenious solution to a design problem and look how we've figured it out. And it's, yep. and it's called battery, right? And you would have held it up, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, it, and and everybody would have lost their shit and applauded, right. right? Right. And he would, you know, and every one of our competitors is trying to stick their battery on the strap or they're trying to stick it on, you know, on, on front of your face and it gets hot and it's stupid. And, we, you know, we've made it over here and we have this great new cable that'll connect to it. And it's the best way to power, you know, this device is such a supercomputer that it needs a big battery. And the best place to put a big battery is right here in your pocket. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Perfect messaging. Um, they don't, yeah, maybe there's not that style of messaging anymore. There's not really that style. <laughs> I find that Apple doesn't do that style of messaging of like, the world's best, you know, we, we cracked it and nobody else could. It's, they only, they, they almost message everything as a plain statement of fact, the, the, you know, they, they just say, they just describe things rather than make big claims. But Steve's whole vibe was making the big claim because he could back it up. And it's sort of knowing when he was bragging about the thing that really was worth bragging about. Sure. Like, for example, like the, the iPhone 4 it being the first consumer level device with a retina display mm. that that and like you said, not only made the pixels half the size and made them so you couldn't perceive them visually, but simultaneously, that was the display that put the pixels even closer to the surface of the glass, which, mm. you know, it, Seems like it would be less of a big deal, but was almost as big a deal to making the iPhone seem more futuristic. Well, that yeah. was truly next generation stuff. But like when the first iPhone came out and only had 2G edge networking and it was super slow, mm. he didn't make apologies for it. He was like, this is amazing. Look at this. You're on a cellular network and you're loading the New York Times dot com. Yeah. And yeah, he did it live on stage and it really was slow because he really did do the demo and it really did come in over edge and it took a long time for it to load. But he just, you know, it, but God take damn it, it was an Internet communicator. All in one device. (laughs) There's a great line in uh, the great little writing handbook, the Strunk and White. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the white in Strunk and White is E.B. White, who's, you know, the author of Charlotte's Web, was Mm -hmm. a longtime staff writer at The New Yorker. Um, And Strunk, I forget his first name, but he was White's college writing professor at Cornell or wherever the hell he went to school. And... uh, it's it's a funny book. It's worth as a writer, I think, rereading every couple of years because it's like, ah, oh, that's good advice. I always forget about that. I should do that. Blah blah blah. But it's not even writing advice. But Strunk has this line where if you're reading aloud and you come across a word you don't know how to pronounce, say it loud. <laughs> if you don't know how to pronounce it, say it loud. He repeats it, and I, you know, and it's like. Uh, trust me, I know what it's like to not know how to pronounce words. Yeah, you're the king. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the king. And uh, so that that advice really struck with me where it, it's like I'm also I, I am surprisingly self-conscious about the fact that I, you know, there's dozens and dozens of words still in my vocabulary that I encountered as a young reader, made my best guess as to how they were pronounced. And then my brain cemented that guess into place. Uh, it's endearing. I love it. But the idea that you just ah, go with it, say it loud, say that word that you don't know how to pronounce even louder than the other words. That's mm-hmm. like what Jobs would have done with the battery. Like, yeah, the battery does suck that it's outside and it's heavy and it gets warm and it's attached to a cable that you forget is always attached to you. And if you just stand up and don't have it in your pocket, it falls or something like that. Yeah. Screw it. Say it loud. Say it's totally. the coolest. It's the coolest battery anybody's ever made. Well, I think one of his methods of storytelling was always to include the audience in the journey 
journey and in the problem that was being solved in a way that they don't really necessarily do anymore. Like he always wanted to say, listen, gang, it's really hard to do this shit. And these are all the things that we're coming up against. And this is how we solved it. And I want you to be as excited as I, as I am right now. And it was always genuine. Yeah. That's what he got a thrill out of. I totally agree. All right. Ecosystem. Ecosystem. So yeah, like the, just making sense of this thing and defining it in my first week of using it. It's like, what the hell is it? And I found, you know, just kind of like drawing connections to all the other Apple things that I use. I found like it was, it was useful to sort of define it um, in context of how we would define all the other stuff um, just for starters. Right. So let's see, I've got a, like a list here. We've got, we've got, um, cause I do really think that that is, a, that is kind of a, like, that is a startling innovation of, of this device is, and that, that only Apple could do because they have built this ecosystem, right? That's where they win is cause that's how they make this thing. The most useful is that they tie it all together. Um, so like the, the Mac, for instance, it's the, like I brought it up before. It's a multi work. It's a multi window you workstation. You can, you bring multiple apps together. You can sort of like look at them and work at them, work with them simultaneously to do a lot of stuff at once. And it's all in this pretty well controlled experience within a rectangle of a screen. And I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities with the Mac in the vision OS in that sense. It's that it's a windows based experience where you can bring all these windows together in the world's biggest display. Cause it's, it's, it's your space that, that you're in and you can use it to get a lot of stuff done or just experience a lot of stuff, whether it's consumption or, or creation. That's kind of like one of the things that strongly defines it including the fact that you can actually bring your Mac into the space and work with an actual Mac while you're doing it. Does that, does that resonate with you? I I think it's even more than that though. I kind of feel like Apple has, and on the one hand, it is one of the surprising aspects of the going back to our home view discussion is how many of Apple's own apps still aren't native to vision OS, right? Mm. Like calendar is still actually just the iPad right. app. The only native calendar app is from our friends at fantastic out right now. Mm. Um, hold on. Let me, let me actually bring it up and look in that folder. Um, the, the calendar, the books app, uh, Maps, you know, is is still a, a iPad app. Yeah. But you look at the ones on the home screen, the first home screen that you don't get to adjust, and you kind of get a sense of what Apple sees as the key apps of the whole, e- not of the device, but of the ecosystem, right? Apple TV, Apple Music, Settings, App Store, Notes, Photos, Safari, Freeform, which I do think sticks out as something that most people don't think of as one of the most used Apple apps. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it sort of speaks to the, that's the one that sort of gets elevated uh, as maybe being especially useful on this device. Yeah. The most aspirational mail messages and then keynote, you know, and, and like I've joked before, like all, all three of the iWork apps are equal, but, keynote is more equal than the other. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. And and that demo of that demo of the rehearsal environment for keynote is a, is a showstopper. Right. Right. But I think you're right. Freeform is a great one. It's aspirational and it invites you to participate, but I think front and center like photos is right in there in the middle because to me, that's the highest priority app for, for the vision pro. But in that list, and so there's in my mindfulness is on that screen. I'm not. I don't use the mindfulness stuff. It's I don't very meditate. cool, but I don't use it either. Yeah, I, I just you know. So there's a couple of exceptions there that I wouldn't say as cornerstones of the ecosystem, but the ones that are the corners of the Apple ecosystem, Safari, May, and not necessarily in this order. I don't know, but, you know, but it it's almost impossible to prioritize them Mm -hmm. photos mail messages notes safari you know they're all there my bookmarks are all there 
my history syncs across them with iCloud. So like if I'm looking for uh, oh, Casey Neistat's video, you know, going around New York while wearing it, I was just looking at it on an iPad, but I want to see it on this because I want to make it big. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as I start typing YouTube, my history fills in and it's like the second one there already. Yeah. Oh, it's already right there. All the notes that I took while using this connected to a keyboard, like, and I'm sure you've, you know, got like a whole pile of Apple notes piled up with your observations of this. Yeah. The fact that they're all there. And then when you're uh, grocery shopping 15 miles from home, and with just your phone with you and another thought comes into your head like, oh, I wanted to try blank next time I'm with Vision Pro. And you take mm -hmm. out your phone and there's your notes and you mm -hmm. just peck it out with your thumbs on your notes. And then the next time you're using, using Vision Pro, you're like, what was that thing I wrote to myself at the grocery store? It's right there, right? Yeah. I, it almost sounds superficial because these are like, the most we think of them as basic apps, right? You well, you have to have a notes app, you have to have a web browser, you have to have an email app, right? Uh, but the way that Apple has made these apps feel native and first class on everything from phones to Macs and now this gives them this incredible leg up over. I mean, who's their closest competitor? I think most people would agree it's probably Meta, you know coming you know that that they've you know the oculus uh hardware division you know has been very well regarded you know for years and that you know they're sort of doing a bottom-up strategy trying to go from 500 hundred dollar devices and make them better year over a year and apple's coming from a okay let's start with our minimum viable awesome product oh it's going to cost four thousand dollars well we'll make it cheaper as time goes on year mm -hmm. over year um i think that's an interesting strategic difference right that meta is tr and, and meta also has the ray-ban glasses and and you've worn what was the product that you had that was more glasses like uh it's not from meta oh uh it's, it's called x real air yeah yeah x x real air and you know you let me try them at WWDC w this year, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. And, and really, it's not like, holy, holy friggin' shit like this. But it is like, oh, wow, that's cool. I could see, I could see now what you're talking about. Like, right. once you let me try those on, everything you had said good about them made a lot more sense to me than, than I believed beforehand. Right. But it still is more of a bottom-up approach. Let's yeah, start with a single function, just like right. MetaQuest is essentially single function as well. It's a gaming device. And right. Yeah. The, but we're, the, right. so I think that strategic complete opposite approach. Do we start with $500 devices and grind it out year over year to make those $500 devices better? Or do we start with a $4,000 device and try to bring it down to a reasonable price? Let's see how it goes. I kind of feel like Apple has more experience with hardware platforms. And so, you know, not just my personal f fandom of Apple's products, I just kind of feel like you're betting on a proven winner if you think Apple's strategy is better. Yeah. But where I feel like people aren't even talking about it is that Meta doesn't have any kind of ecosystem like this of their own web browser, their own notes app, their own email. How do you get your email on this thing? How do how do you get your email accounts into it? Yeah. You know? No, they're not thinking of that at all. Even their own user account system in that in the in their own gaming device ecosystem, gaming device ecosystem is pretty broken, as is Microsoft's. You know, Google's is the, probably the furthest along in terms of tying, you know, your user account into like different spaces, not necessarily different hardware, but it transports from platform to platform, from site to site. There's something that Google knows about you as a person that is very transportable, but Meta doesn't have that. Microsoft tries, but like really spectacularly clumsily fails. Yeah, Google is definitely the closest, but it's hard for me to, and again, maybe it's my bias because I just, I don't like Google's style of such things. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't. I don't like Google Keep as a notes app. It doesn't fit with my brain. And, you know, Apple Notes isn't my very 
ideal of a notes app. I tried making my ideal of a notes app 10 years ago with Vesper. I mean, I have strong opinions on notes apps, but notes is a lot closer to the way I think a notes app should work than Google keep is. I don't like, I, I personally don't like Google Chrome as much and putting aside the rendering engines. I just don't like the interface to it as much as Safari. Um, and, and the further you get into the ecosystem, the more, you know, and like, and I don't see like people who use the actual Gmail interface. When you type gmail.com into a desktop browser, it doesn't look anything to me like the Gmail that you get on your phone when you open the Gmail app. It looks like two totally different interfaces to it. Whereas Apple's mail looks like it's not the Mac version shrunk to the iPhone, but it looks like a sibling product from the same designers and that they, oh yes, this is what the phone version of this desktop email app would look like. Um, There's definitely design aesthetic and spiritual consistency across right. across products you know in the different platforms and apple music and apple uh tv you know yeah. th- it, it, there's a reason why on the home screen the very top left position is the tv app oh absolutely you know going back to the home screen something so th- i came across this the first time i was trying to add a contact in the vision pro and they there is no contacts app Right. If you look over to the left of the home screen, you've got that little drawer that slides out and it's apps, people, and environments, which is essentially things, people, and places, right? People, places, things. Mm. Um, apps is like functions, tools. Right. People, they just want, if you click, if you tap on that, you open up people and you just get like a list of people that you commonly communicate with, you, which is bizarre. Um but it's an interesting way of thinking about it. This morning, my friend texted me a VCF, like a contact, you know, like you can do yeah. tech, share a contact. I opened in the visit in the vision pro and I tried to do anything with it. It wanted to save it as a file in my files app. And then, so I saved it as a file. And then when I went to open that file, it was just like, congratulations, you have a dot VCF file. What do you, I can't do anything with this. So, um, it was, it's, it's just like that, that, that people space in your home view tells you a lot about what vision OS prioritizes, I think. Do you think, though, that there's a chance that – because this is where you and I together sort of got the Apple Watch wrong, mm-hmm. right? Like you and I both bought into when it was debuted the communication features, you know, yeah. the – you know, oh, if you've got a sweetheart and you both have an Apple Watch, you can share your pulse with your sweetheart as a sort <laughs> yeah. of a, a remote gesture of affection. Right. Um, I, re- I remember, I, I think, walking down the street in San Jose, like, just, like, you know, have, dreaming big dreams about how that sh- that shared heartbeat was going to be the killer app <laughs> for the watch. I, and it's funny now, so many years later, and, you know, I don't even I don't even know if the feature is there anymore. Maybe it, there's a way yeah, to get know. to it in messages, but nobody talks about it. But uh, I'm, you know, happy to just say, well, I was wrong, yeah. you know. I, but I think Apple was wrong, and I think it sort of comes as close to admitting that they were wrong. But I also think it was worth trying on Apple's part, and I don't think it was foolish that we thought, hey, maybe there's something there, there, right? Yeah, I mean, they were just but, trying to forge human connection into the product, which is, I, oof, that's great. But I wonder if it's that same desire to forge human connection into the product that has made them make people as top level of a thing as apps and environments. Yeah. That's really right? interesting. Yeah. I, I can kind of, you know, make maybe this time they've got it, you know, this time it's right yeah. that it is personal and you need, you know, it's worth having people there so that you, you know, like that's how you start a FaceTime call. You don't, there is no FaceTime app either. You go to people, right. find the person and then it says, well, what do you want to do with Adam? Do you want to start a <laughs> yeah. FaceTime call? Yeah, I want to start a FaceTime call. Okay, right. start a FaceTime call. Or do you want to start a voice call or something? Um, right, I guess which, can- is, which essentially tells you that this that's how Apple ties it into the iPhone, is that that part of the product they're calling a communicator, right? Right. So yeah, there's so you can message a person, FaceTime them, and then there's a dot, dot, dot where you can do more. You can like email them, get info. 
pin them. So right, but like the, app, that's Apple basically saying the vision is your is your OS for the people in your life. Right, it's how you make those outward connections, and so that's kind of cool. I mean, like again, tying it into the ecosystem, they're assuming that people are going to using going to be using this thing is at the same time as they're using it as an like a Mac for multi window multi app workstation. They're going to be using it as a communications device, which I'm fully on board with. We're do, we've been doing it for two hours now, and, and it feels as natural as anything. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I guess it, it's good that the Newton exists in the sense that it, it, I think it's still, I think there's very few people, just because it was so long ago, that there's very few people at Apple left who were there for the Newton. But mm-hmm. You know, it's a humbling platform because, you know, obviously there's no other way to describe it than as a failed platform. You know, Mm -hmm. it was around for a couple of years. And I know that the people who are the staunchest aficionados of the Newton platform are sure some of them listen to my podcast (laughs) and I'm sure they're angry right now. And they still blame Steve Jobs that, you know, it wasn't that the Newton failed. It was that uh, it, you know, when they had to cut costs to save the company from bankruptcy, they cut it when jobs came back and maybe he was biased against it because it wasn't his creation, you know, and I think there's probably is something to that, you know, that, uh, and the Newton had a lot of good things going for it. I've always thought that, you know, but I, where I'm going is, is this possible that this vision headset will be the next Newton for the Apple? Fuck no. Like, I, I don't think that, I think that's the I wrongest th- statement to, to make about this thing. You shared, you shared that Beeple tweet. You well, know, why though? Me. Why do you think there's no way that it's a Newton? Because the Newton was so far ahead of its time. It was so constrained by the available tech at the time that it could never have delivered on the promises of the product, right? This thing is not ahead of its time. It took mm-hmm until this time to make this product real. And uh, to me, it's spectacularly successful at it, even as hobbled as it may be in vision in version one, this product is exactly of its time. Yeah. I would say like the defining, what does it, what does that mean? What does it need to, to be ready right now? It mm-hmm. needs super high resolution displays mm-hmm. and it, that's, it has these, right? Yeah. Everybody's impressed by the visual resolution. Uh, I think it needs really killer sound. I, I think even though, like I said, like it's called Vision Pro, everybody's most blown away by the visual experience. But I think that the spatial audio, either through the built-in speakers or with AirPods that do spatial audio, it, the sp- spatiality, for lack of a, I don't even know if that is a word, but you know, <laughs> I think so. it, it, it is important. It, it, um, I think that the stability of the placement of 3d objects where they stay exactly in place not like Mm -hmm. oh if you leave a window in your kitchen and then you walk out of the room and come back and it's like ah it's like almost in the exact same space (laughs) but it's like two inches no it is literally to the inch in the exact space where you left it Mm -hmm. I think it needs that. I think that's actually important to the experience that these things don't flicker. They don't, they don't wobble a little bit in space. They are as a stable in three, three dimensional space. Uh, and it needs pretty good input. You know, it needs good enough finger gesture resolution, you know, uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. They've got all of that, yeah. right? That's the sort of baseline. I, I can't think of anything else that it really needs. I mean, I guess you could say it needs a fast enough CPU. Or I, I guess that R1 chip is the sort of breakthrough. The fact mm-hmm. that it has this you know, incredibly low latency from the cameras to the screens in front of your eyes that reduces the nausea inducing latency of other headsets and makes it more comfortable for some people just to even use for five minutes. And then for other people just to be able to use like for this, for, what are we on two, two hours, 15 minutes of this call, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it needs all of that. And the Newton didn't have that, right? The Newton, I, I would, I've always thought the big glaring thing in hindsight was that the Newton never should have come out before wireless networking mm. that, that just and 
that would have been almost, you know, if they waited for Wi-Fi, that would have been, you know, eight or nine years, seven or eight years, something like that. A lot. They would have had to wait for a long time. But yeah. what was the point in hindsight? And I know I just said that I spent my freshman year of my college dorm using a Macintosh computer without a network. But there was a lot that I actually, I, I felt like I was doing stuff and making and creating stuff. Whereas the Newton wasn't really a creative device. You didn't make artwork on it. You didn't, you know. No, it, it was a PDA, it, but it had terrible handwriting recognition. So the input sucked. And it so was the, the input, butt of every joke. You know, the, the, the naysayers remark, though, would be, well, didn't we just complain about the on-screen keyboard in this <laughs> yeah. thing? Yeah, but that's the on-screen keyboard is one of, you know, four different input methods right. for, you know, for exactly. for getting for communicating We're, into the thing. So Whereas with the Newton it was the pen was the only one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you couldn't just hit a microphone button and dictate to it right. to get around the handwriting recognition. Yeah. And remember that the the general magic device had internet connectivity or, you know, did it cellular con- 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 connectivity too. So I don't know I don't know that that's necessarily what felled the Newton. Right. And I know Palm and before, you know, Palm came out with the trios, right? That was what Mm -hmm. they called the cell phone ones, which was, it did, it it was a huge leg up for the Palm platform because then they had some networking. But I would, I've always, using this device and seeing a couple people uh, not even trying to troll or shitpost, but just sort of tossing it out as a spitball, as a spitball, like a, just a mental exercise. Well, you know, it, debate the side that this might be the next Newton in Apple's history, you know, and just think about it. Mm-hmm. It makes me realize it, it comes to that ecosystem question or, or topic that you had mm-hmm. where this product, in addition to having all that hardware tech in a, I would, you know, you could say it's too expensive, but at least if you, if you've already bought it and it's in your budget, it's all there. Mm-hmm. The thing that this product has that the Newton didn't is this incredibly rich, broad, shared ecosystem with the other devices in your life. And at the time the Newton came out, the only other product Apple had was the Mac. And you did technically, if you, you know, there was, a, what was it called? Like Newton Connection Kit or something like that. Did you have a Newton? I didn't, no. I th- I, it's not even worth Googling. I, I guess I'll make a note and put it in the show notes. Well, but I there had wasn't... a Palm, which is a close enough comparison. And, you know, there was like Palm Sync, which was always a huge pain yeah. in the ass. But they, they were, that's that's how they tried to, to leap over the, you know, the, the leap, cross the bridge of the ecosystem. So it was an early yes. proof of concept. So there was some kind of rudimentary way that you could uh, get your contacts from your Mac into the Newton. But the Mac didn't even have an address book at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Like that was from an era on the Mac where Microsoft and Apple as the two big platform makers sort of demurred from providing lots of first-party applications. Like you do... Mm-hmm. Uh, to cut open the seal on your brand new PC or Mac. And it didn't really have much on it that did anything out of the box, right? No, you, they you had know, chess, but they didn't have contacts for some, yeah, and, until and, it was 10. And yeah, you know, the Mac didn't even have chess. I don't think that was a, a next thing, right? Oh, and I thought the Windows, Mac had chess for some reason. I don't think so. I don't think mm. in the classic era, I think that all came over from the next year. I don't even think mm. it had a game. It had like the puzzle game, you know, the, right, right, right. right the, yeah. the, 16 squares where you slide the numbers around, um, you know, and a rudimentary text editor, you know, just for reading readme files and stuff like that. So there wasn't any kind of way, like, even if you were a diehard Mac user and you're like, okay, I'm all in. And uh, now I've spent all this money to buy a Newton communicator. Where's all my Mac stuff? You know, there were none of the apps were the same. There was no shared data infrastructure. So even forgetting that it didn't have wireless networking, even with a cable, you weren't really sharing a foundational layer of ecosystem apps, like a notes app, right? Mm-hmm. You just didn't have any of this. Whereas all of this is already there on day one with Vision. And it's all this stuff, you know, how many notes? Here, I'm going to look at my notes. Out. I have to turn my head. Uh, 
one thousand. I have one thousand eight hundred fifty-one notes in Apple Notes. Yeah, I use like, I use Bear, but they're going. My notes are going back to like two thousand eleven or something like that. Yeah. So how how many? You know, you've probably got like a thousand notes. Yeah, yeah thousands, thousands already on day one, right? Yeah. And, and they're just there. You just log in with your iCloud account, which you didn't even have to do, right? right. You just brought your phone up to your thing. Absolutely. And it's, not. And it's like, oh, you're, this is your phone and it's nearby. Okay. We'll just, we'll get your Wi Fi password from your phone. We'll get your iCloud account from your phone. And this stuff will just start piling in. Yeah. And we know it's you because of your iris, which is equally crazy or whatever it is, you know, you're because of the, you're, you, you know, your eyeball. I, I just, and, uh, I just, it's so easily overlooked because you just think, well, it's just a notes app. And of course the notes app that the platform maker makes should sync across your various devices. And of course your bookmarks and your browsing history should sync across devices. And if you, uh, if you get a, a, a new email address, like you change the, you know, sandwich.co instead of whatever, you know, sandwich video, you guys change your domain at some point. Yeah. Right? We're sandwich.co now. Yeah. You're sandwich.co. And so at some point in the last couple of years, I changed your email address in my right. contact and I only had to do it once. Right. And on all my devices, I have your new email address, right? Yeah. You think, well, of course it should work like that. But I think that there is like, if you really think about how much work that is under our feet for this ecosystem, it is, it's, it, it's mind boggling. Right. Yeah. And I don't think a company like meta, even though they're big and have lots of money and lots of engineers, like I don't even think they're trying to catch up. No, for, there was a time in, in the Oculus days when they were, when meta was going to make it so that in order to use their VR, you had to have a Facebook account basically. And man, I was so pissed off about that. Cause I'd already deactivated mine right. long ago. They corrected that decision. And now you can just have a, you know, an account for the meta quest. That's not connected. But even that, I think they were like edging towards that. They were suggesting that they were going to try to build an ecosystem that was all tied together so that they could advertise to you everywhere equally. But, um, you know, it's not happening. And there's just so much smart, brilliant building going on in, in the Apple world that in, in Apple space, you could almost call it, um, that ties it all together. And I think just like moving down the line. So this is what I've got on my list, Mac, iPhone, iPad, watch AirPods, Apple TV, and a home pod, right? These are all the, the main, the, the, the main core products. So moving on down to iPad, Really, you've got what you've got is a small screen enter media device, like a small screen entertainment media consumption window. And I mean, th that's here. That's here in Vision OS. It's it is that if the one of the one of the pillars of def defining this, the Vision Pro is it is a media consumption device. It's it's a it's a huge screen media consumption device. Remember back in the days when we would discuss whether Apple was ever going to make its own TV screen, right? right? Well, they just did, yep. right? And it is enormous. It sh and and that's that's really fun. That's a great fun way to spend time thinking about this thing. Yeah. And it's one of the things that people bring up the most often. It's like, oh wow, I can't. I don't know if I'll do any work with it, but I know I'm going to watch movies in this thing. I I tried to touch on that in my review, right? Where where I really do think this is a credible thirty five hundred dollar device if it's just for watching movies yeah, and yeah. including those three D immersion type things. Yeah. And and you've got to be as a professional filmmaker, it, it it has to be so like I don't think my writing reads better if you do it in Vision Pro in a big. <laughs> 10 foot safari window, right? What's reading your favorite, kind of what's your favorite, just as an aside, what's your favorite way for people to read your writing? Hmm. Like what platform? Ah, I don't really have an opinion on that. Okay. I, but I guess I, uh, well, it shows how sh shameful it is that I don't really have an iPhone optimized 
layout for the site, but I would guess maybe the iPhone or yeah. the iPad, you yeah. know, I guess the, I guess the iPad, I would say would be the best way. If, if you said, you know, if I had to write like a, f- you know, if I was heading off to prison for five years and I had a <laughs> goodbye post, you see in five years, you know, uh, what's the best way to read that? I, I guess I'd say the iPad cause yeah, it's a little more it. intimate than the Mac, you sure. know, and it's it, the in-between device, I think. Yeah, and it doesn't quite feel like trying to trying to gulp down water, dying of thirst through a tiny little straw like the iPhone screen can be for a long article, yeah. right? Like sometimes I, I even I, you know, who write long, long articles will sometimes look at a long article on my phone and be like, eh, "I'll save that for later." On <laughs> yeah. Um, but for film, for for watching videos, this is. F- flabbergastingly good mm-hmm. i mean just unbelievable and it makes me realize like like in a way that the groundwork of um uh, the ecosystem of these apps was there for this platform to launch with already there where you've already got mail messages notes safari and all of your core apps um one thing I've noticed watching like YouTube and stuff on this device is it really makes it obvious why it's worth, it's been worth for years now shooting 4k video mm-hmm. because to me where 4k video really shines over the last two weeks, isn't watching it on a 4k TV where it's just sort of one-to-one it's when you make a giant window here that's actually too big for 4K, mm-hmm. right? You're actually stretching beyond the limits of, you know, ideally for a window the size that I've made most of my YouTube videos in Christian Seelig's Juno app should be shot in 8K, right? Mm-hmm. It's an 8K size virtual window in front of me, but people aren't shooting 8K yet. They're shooting 4K. Mm-hmm. But because it's 4K and not 1080p, it looks way better than 1080p. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it looks better, even stretched to the point of a bit of graininess and noise by making the 4K so big. It's it's the best 4K has ever looked. And it's like, I can't believe it. I, I like I really did. Did you watch Casey Neistat's video? I, I know did, it's yeah. you know, it's got like six million views. He, I, I it was my favorite it. I, of all the videos, I think, because uh, it, it he expressed the ineffable somehow Mm -hmm. right but some of the just random shots they weren't setups you know it was like he's out in times square he just decided to wear the thing with a battery pack to keep it going all day and he and a photographer were he's just walking around times square one one chance to get the shot you know Uh, but looking at it it was like uh, i was like i they just put this together in like 24 hours and it looks unbelievable. It's yeah. Well, unbelievable. I think that the, what the main takeaway of that video that I, he says at the end that he wasn't even expecting to get out of it. Cause he was just going to go out into times square as a joke, as like a goof, right. as a stunt. I think that he was able to, in capturing that experience, he was able to communicate the concept of scale in the vision pro, which the like as we've talked about during this 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 call we that's what the device is about it's about putting windows bigger than you could ever have access to in your office in your on your desktop in your laptop and he went to the largest scale right. place of the largest city you know in the, in the country <laughs> and where the screens are enormous and on the sides of buildings and he was like fuck you i can do this too and he put his screens everywhere, and it was like that is what this device is. And I think it was breathtaking for him as he was riding around on a skateboard, and he just sold that to the audience, yep. and, I, and I loved it. Yeah, you know, because in a way, I think what made it part of what made his video so genius is you're definitely not supposed to go out and about in daily life with this thing. That's not what it's intended to be. And he emphasized that you know, you're and like I say over and over again, your windows remain static in space. Mm-hmm. And so when you see these videos of most people goofing while they're crossing the street while wearing a Vision Pro or they're coming out of the mall wearing it and they're making these gestures with their hands as they walk. That's all fake. It's obviously right. fake because none of the windows in – almost none. It's like there's a couple that stay hovering in front of you like uh, 
when you connect AirPods, it'll say, hey, do you want to connect these AirPods? Mm -hmm. That window will stay, as you're walking, will stay an equal distance in front of your face. But 99% of the interface stays behind as you walk. So all the people making these videos where they're pretending to gesture at things while they walk across the street are faking it. Yeah. Whereas he mentioned that. He was just being completely honest. And by wearing it in a place where it's not really meant to be used, Times Square, New York, and showing the footage of what he was seeing, it it's somehow the wrongness of using it there showed off the amazingness of what it's capable of doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, you kind of, br- you briefly mentioned it, but as a tool for uh, filmmakers, for visual storytellers, the opportunities here are so exciting. And I think hopefully most of the industry is thinking in this way, but not only are we now thinking of like telling big scale stories because we've got access to these big scale screens, but telling stories in three dimensions, um, we now have access to in an, in an intriguing way that, you know, most people don't want to put 3d glasses on, but if they're already in this thing, they're going to want to see stories in stereo. But also for me as a technology storyteller, telling tech stories about this tech, about this space is so much more compelling than shot of the iPhone over and over again, yeah, you know, yeah. over the shoulder. We are, I've been stuck in the rectangles in the boxes for 15 <laughs> years of doing this now. And finally we get to put this stuff in floating in space the way we've been trying to do it for all these years. <laughs> How many times do you think you've composited fake iPhone oh screens? Oh my God, hundreds or maybe thousands. <laughs> At some point, one of my, my friend, Tim Karras, who, uh, who was doing a lot of those early comps with me, we were, we were, we were doing a green screen app for the phone and we were going to make a, just a uh, compilation reel of all of the sandwich over the folder, over the shoulder device shots. But <laughs> yeah, that, that technology is so squaint, the squaint, the quaint at this point, those small screen experiences are so quaint relative to this. And it's like, I know YouTube started as a desktop website and you can, you know, however big a display you have connected to your Mac or PC was how big you could make a YouTube video. Um, It just feels like though, you know, coincidental or not, I think YouTube exploded in popularity when mobile exploded in popularity. And it's, you know, there was some kind of fit between nine seven to nine minute video short films and what you could want to watch on your phone while you're sitting on the subway or while you're waiting in line at the grocery store or wherever else um and it was fantastic for popularity and it's made youtube you know a world-changing platform um but creatively, like from your perspective, it, it does sort of come back to the David Lynch argument, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. don't watch my fucking movie on your fucking <laughs> yeah. cell phone, right? Like, I don't, you know, it's meant to be looked at at a big, beautiful screen. Right. And now it's like we've gone through the looking glass and these, anybody, any kid with a phone that has like a, you know, and every phone you can buy from the last few years has a really good camera on it. And oh. you can you can make movies that are movie theater size and look good movie theater size. Yep. We just got, uh, so we got invited, some of us at Sandwich got invited to meet with the Apple Pro team because they wanted to talk to us about shooting real professional video in log space with the iPhone 15 Pro. And it was a really, it was a transformative meeting for me because I was not thinking in that direction. We've always used the high-end digital cameras to shoot our commercials. And um, I'm so glad we, though they invited us because we started doing it. Just last week we shot it, we shot our first like legit startup commerce sandwich video with, uh, with multiple iPhones. And it looks fantastic. And you using, some of the pro capture apps, either black magic or, you know, Sebastian's got Kino coming out, um, that allow you to capture these, uh, these images in, in like really high resolution and log space. So you can do a lot more 
with color in post and it gives it it gives everyone access to being filmmakers whether professional or not and making true films that is incredible and it's not only incredible just on its own for making video but it's incredible for this device too it's incredible that we're going to be able to capture in the in the phone watch these things in vision and at, you know in large enormous scale screens and what a what a time what a world I've I, I, there's just people whose work I've never seen on a big screen before. Really, yeah. I mean, I, I guess you know you might be one of them, right? It's like yeah. I, you know, True. and I've watched a lot of your videos over the years, but I've never seen one. Maybe a handful of times on a TV, you know, and yeah. never on anything bigger than a TV. And yeah. now I can watch everything you've ever shot on a legit movie theater size screen. Right. Oh man, that's exciting. It's emotionally so different and so much more engaging, right? And it's it's just terribly exciting as, as a consumer of video. I can't even imagine how exciting it is as as a filmmaker. Yeah, it is. I watched a Star Wars. I, I watched the Last Jedi um, in the Disney theater. You know, in that experience, yeah. that that was really great for me. Yeah, it's super, super exciting. Um, so moving moving down the line, the, we've got the watch <laughs> next on my list. All right. And I actually think that, like, for th- when I got to the watch, I was thinking, okay, well, there's nothing in common with the watch. Vision Pro has nothing in common with the watch. But I was absolutely wrong because, first of all, that the home view is very visually similar to the home view of of the of the watch home view. But also just the the hard the in the design the hardware design, you've got the digital crown in common, which which is f- kind of fascinating to me that those are the only two Apple products that work the same way, right. and also basically if you take the take the light seal off of the device and even if you want to take the straps off too, and just look at it hold it in your hand as a piece of hardware, and it's actually pretty um, reminiscent of the of the Apple Watch in its mm. roundness and like how the, the seamless this the seamless uh uh joining of the of the glass and the and the and the yeah. metal yeah. so th- yeah that's that's all i would say about that otherwise there's not a lot of crossover yeah all right next time um, list. airpods i mean really spatial audio and the, yeah. the idea that audio can be augmented reality yeah and, it, it, you know, I've been saying that argument, making that argument, at least since the noise canceling AirPods came out, that it's it, it is their their Apple's first AR product. Yep. Exactly. But uh, but it's like using this, it it feels like seamlessly stepping from one platform to another without even worrying about the gap or any kind of it's like, oh, yeah, this is like AirPods plus plus, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the the fact that it's so usually they say augmented reality is when you're just adding a layer of digital on top of the real. But I think that the the Vision Pro is an augmented reality because it's actually replacing, it's reproducing reality. So it's more like vision, it's more like um virtual reality, I think. I think that's the that's the technical definition, but the 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 uh, AirPods do the same thing. They reproduce yep. this the sound reality of your world and they use that to make it feel transparent. Yeah. And I'm just playing around. I don't know what you can see in my persona. I'm playing around with my digital crown. I've spent most ever since we started talking about whether I was on the moon or in my, (laughs) in my basement, I've settled into the moon and I just dialed it back to my basement. And I realized Again, I'll just say the same thing again. It's just uncanny how intimate you sound when I'm dialed out to the moon and it's right. not trying to bounce your voice off these walls in this room. It is, it's intimate, really. Yeah. Uh, I honestly, that, that this is something I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but you, you I mean, this is just to break the fourth wall a little bit, you and I are close personal friends, mm-hmm. right? You're like a, a dear friend. And I, I I don't know that I would like doing this if with a guest <laughs> on my show who I don't consider as dear a friend. You know what I mean? And I know most of the people I have on a regular basis are my friends. Yeah. 
And so most of them it would work, but you know, I occasionally have special guests on who just have a new product out or something like this. I almost feel like talking like this to somebody for two hours is too much, right? Yeah, it's it's, it's like being, being like you and I can get in a car together and go on a four hour drive and we'll talk each other's ears off the whole right. time about this same stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, but if you were with a stranger, you don't want to be caught in a car with them for <laughs> No, minutes. I wonder if there's other ways of creating more distance if it's an uncomfortable like intimacy yeah. in this in this context. Whether I don't know, I almost like to me it was almost fun to like the idea of share cuz I have my MacBook camera on me looking like a complete dork with big goggles on and in front of a microphone and I almost like want that in the corner of my you know of my FaceTime mm-hmm. window so you can yeah. see like Oh, it's actually not that intimate. I'm actually just sitting. I'm a real yeah. guy in a real place, and yeah. probably have food in my beard. <laughs> no, you don't, because you're an ideal. You're an idealized version of you. You're, <laughs> right. you're a persona, right? right, right. <laughs> there is, and I know that everybody's slagging on personas, but I'm really enjoying this call. I yeah. am, and I feel like it's you, and I do feel like there's this other aspect where it's like, man, you, you can just wake up and you don't have to comb your hair. You don't yeah, have it's to. Great. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about, you know, oh, you know what? I'm, I didn't even take a shower. I've got the same shirt on I had on yesterday. Yeah. What well, doesn't matter because it, you, your persona has the shirt on and when you captured your persona. Yeah. I joined a Zoom call, a client Zoom call with like five members of my team, three members of the client side. And I joined it in Zoom on the Vision Pro, but I kept my camera off for almost the whole meeting until like the last two minutes. And then I was like, okay, let's try this. Let's see, <laughs> let's experiment, see what happens. And you know, we all know what it's like that first initial shock of seeing a digital persona in a flat window is like, ugh, take it away. But then you move past it very quickly. Yeah. All right. Next on your list, you have next, Apple TV. Um, Apple TV. Yes. Um, I mean, that's pretty clear. It's, it's uh, Apple TV used to be the biggest screen, big screen media browser. And it's now there for the communal, communal experience of watching media. I'm very excited when this become when vision becomes more prevalent because then it can become more communal as well. But that's what a TV is. It's for, it's for there to be an object in your space that people can sort of like look at at the same time and enjoy the same entertainment um and then the last one is home pod but that's almost not even it's same as spatial audio it adjusts itself to the physics of your space and it's also a siri client um right. so i guess that's how it ties in but yeah no all all sort of laddering up to this idea that the vision is really it's not really one it's not its own thing it's it's sort of everything all at once you know, it's a container for every Apple product. Yeah, it kind of is. And it's... It, and it's weird because I'm not, I'm not envisioning a future. And who knows? Maybe we are. You know, especially when they, you know, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, when these things really are just like glasses. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe I really, I wake up in the morning, I put my glasses on, and I've got this OS in front of me until I go to bed, take them off, put them on my nightstand, and that's when they charge. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, where I, you know, and if me and Amy both wear the glasses, then we don't even need a TV, and, I'm, and we just, you know, we are having a shared experience next to each other on a couch and we're not isolated with goggles. We just have glasses on, but we can see the same movie or TV show. Uh, maybe, you know, but even if that never comes to pass, I feel like, um, I, I, there's something about the fact that this does encompass all of those products. It really, you know, it really does. It, and it's right now it's in a very personal way. That's just for you, but it's like, man, this is sort of a better version of all of those things. Yeah. I think where it gets to eventually, even in the glasses form, which I believe that the glasses form is still an intermediary step to its final, to the end game. Let's say it does get miniaturized into glasses that you can take on and put on and take off. Um, 
it will be a communal product where we can both experience the same digital reality. Right. But past that, I think it's jacking right into your central nervous system and making you see these pixels that are, that are not physically in any form. You know, I don't think, I think lenses go away, screens go away. And what's kind of you, what's interesting about the vision pro version one is to me, it's showing us an early version of that end game where pixels are just in our space. Digital stuff is just in our physical space. And that's the world that we're that we're lean that's that that's the word that we're that's the world that we're rushing to that's 20 years away yeah um we've been talking long enough that where we just i I wasn't quite sure what happened to me but we must have crossed the sunset boundary here in philadelphia (laughs) yeah because the moon went pitch black oh wow yeah yeah so you've got an environment set on automatic I've got my environment sent to automatically switch between light mode and dark mode, which yeah. when you're in an artificial outdoor environment, which I guess the moon qualifies as, it means it gets dark. And Yeah, this boy, happened boy, to me last night dark. where my environment just shut off completely. And I'm not talking about nighttime. I'm talking about blackness. There was a huh. void. And I don't, it, was a, it was a hardware hiccup. You hmm. know, the, uh, the hardware has only crashed on me once, but the software has crashed a few times. And, uh, yeah, just like my windows were there and it was blackness behind and it was really unnerving. (laughs) We still Uh, need the real world, man. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever had the hardware crash, but I've definitely had it. The, uh, I don't know where, where to place the blame, but there was one time during the review process where I had to figure out how to restart it. And I guess yeah. the, the answer is, so you know about force quitting, right? You, yeah. you hold down both buttons for four seconds and you get a force quit menu yep. that's just like the Mac version. It's really neat. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you think force quitting is cool. I think it's but, cool. I think it's, it's very useful. <laughs> um, but if you just keep pressing them for like eight seconds or 10 seconds, it restarts the whole system. Yeah, so you, you just, get this. Don't you get a slider to like, yeah. Sw- yeah, to, to shut down? And if you keep pressing the two buttons, though, it'll do it automatically, even without the slider. Like if it gets so locked right. up okay. that it won't let you slide. Yeah. Right. But the the way I restarted it during my review process, I didn't figure that out. I just pulled the power cable out of yeah. the side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, and it, but the fact that some of the apps can be buggy and need to be forced quit, to me, it's just part of, honestly, part of the fun. It's you early know. game. Yeah. It's early days. It's, and yeah, exactly. You, it's every time there's like a little hiccup like that, you just get to see a little glimpse of where it's going to be, where it's going to improve. Yeah. Oh. This was a wonderful conversation. What a great Thank idea. You. This was wonderful for me. I was really looking forward to this. I, like I said, in my text, I texted to you one of the, th- this, this time happens like what, once when a new platform is introduced once that redefines computing, once every what decade and a decade and a half. And so this first, these first days of capturing this experience in a way that we might remember it in the future. Right. So special. I never yeah. want to forget this. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd never, there's nobody I'd rather do that with than you, John. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Adam. That was very nice. All right. I will also thank our two sponsors of the show, our good friends at Squarespace and trade coffee. You can build a website with one of them and you can, Fill yourself with caffeine from the other one. I'll let you figure out which sponsor was which. Uh, thanks, Adam.